Call this board meeting of the Nelson County Board of Education to order on October 17, 2023 at 5.30 p.m., which really is it's about 5.31 p.m. Please welcome Kayla Summit and Jackson Mattingly, students at Bloomfield Elementary School, as they lead us in the pledge. All stand, please. Thank you very much. Good job. Okay, our next item is recommended. It's a pursuant of KRS 61.8101C, enter into executive session for the discussion with board council relating to pending litigation against the board and district due to the confidential nature of the litigation. Uh, I need a motion. Uh, to move into executive session per KRS 61.8101C for the reasons stated. Do I hear a motion? I make a motion. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. Bowling, do I hear a second? Second. Okay. Second uh, by Mr. Jackie. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? We will now uh, convene into executive session.
I need a motion to reconvene regular session, please. Motion. Okay, thank you, Mr. Jackie. Do I hear a second? Second. A second by Mr. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Uh, Ms. Uh, motion carry. Okay, in review of our executive session, no action was taken. Okay. Okay, with that, I need a motion to remove the person from Cox's Creek Site Based Council recommended by our legal rep and principal. Do I hear a motion? Motion. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ms. Deaton. Second? All second. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Bowling. All in favor? Uh, Aye. All opposed? Motion carry. Okay. Okay, our next item is our meeting goal and agenda, and that's Superintendent Bradley, please. Welcome to Bloomfield Elementary School. Thank you for all that are here tonight. We'll be learning more about the work going on at Bloomfield from their team here shortly. We'll also be learning about some of the work going on across the district uh, with some of our quarterly assessments recently coming out, as well as looking at next steps for the district facility plan. Thank 
you. Okay, our next item is United People, Place, and Purpose, and that is the Bloomfield Elementary Schools dashboard. I also just want to welcome Ann Cox, a 27-year teacher and leader. Who started out at Eli Brown or Chaplin? Chaplin. Chaplin. Can you just tell us briefly your journey so we can make sure we honor that? So 27 years ago, I started at Chaplin. Fifth grade teacher, loved every moment of it. I actually started in October of that year. Um, couldn't have been more excited, a little green of course, but loved every minute of it. So then um, once we consolidated the two schools, Eli and Chaplin, and started Bloomfield Elementary, that's been 19 years ago this coming year, um, I moved here and was here in uh, the classroom for probably 18 years. Then I transferred over into an instructional coach position. And then a couple of years later, I transferred over into an assistant principal. And so this is my third year as principal. And that's why, I mean, I'm excited and privileged to be able to share our BES story with you all tonight. Ready? Have at it. Go. Okay. So our two benefits, our first benefit is um, our mastery of academic skills. And so what we're focused on is to what degree are students demonstrating growth and mastery of our academic skills. So the story started last year. Um, we as a school decided to focus on the four C's. And so we started with you know, communicator, critical thinker, collaborator, and contributor. And so we, what we did is we decided to match some subjects to those uh, four C's. So with communicator, we kind of linked in our literacy skills, which would be our reading, our writing, our um, speaking and listening skills. And then we also, with critical thinker, we attached our math standards to it. With our collaborator, we attached the science standards, and with contributor, we focused on social studies. So we wanted to make sure that we had all our standards covered. We wanted to create a tool that helped us as the staff focus on what we needed to be teaching and focus on throughout that whole year. But we also wanted a tool to share with our parents so that we could discuss data, so that we could say, this is, this is at this point, this is what your child should be able to do. And here are some things we're doing. So twofold with that. So what I want to do now is just let Ms. Walker, who is our literacy specialist, I want to introduce her so that she can talk about where we've been, our journey with our foundational literacy. Okay, so we've been really busy here at BES. Our literacy folks have really put in a lot of time and effort. Um, we started out a few years ago, we started revamping our classroom libraries. Uh, we built math and science libraries so that our math and science classrooms also had those resources. Uh, we've purchased a digital online library that we've had for several years now um, that provides on-level uh, tailored student books for students to, to access at home, which we felt was very important. Um, we also have sound walls in our K-2 classrooms. Um, if you don't know what a sound wall is, look it up. It's really cool. It's a, a bridge between that oral and the actual reading uh, text. So it's a really neat program. We started, we actually have some of that in our preschool now. And we also have many sound walls in our other classrooms. So that's been a, a I think that really got the ball rolling with us. We also uh, developed student phonics profiles for our K through two students and any of our students from three through five who were performing below grade level in reading. So we have, you know, we have that access, that data that tells us where those holes are that we can address. Um, we also have uh, retailored our, re, our, uh, read to, uh, our intervention programs called RTI. So we looked at that and, and changed some things, made some changes, streamlined it, made it more efficient. Um, so we, we really have been working hard. Um, we also had our students develop some exemplars in opinion writing, and we're planning on doing that also with our other types of writing this year and next year. Uh, Two-thirds of our staff, we are a little school, but that's okay. Two-thirds of our staff attended the Summer Pathways this summer, so they got two weeks of extra time to develop assessments and instruction. And last year, 100% of our K-2 students went and uh, had an online training in letters. Um, it's an uh, instruction assessment based on the science of reading, which is the best research we have out there right now for our, how to, the science of learning how to read. So we had 100% of our, our teachers participate in that. So we do have a lot of dedication here with our staff that we're very proud of. 
Uh, we also have Hegarty, which is a, a phonemic awareness program we've installed. And we also got that $40,000 reading grant last year, so we got lots of goodies to go with our intervention mm -hmm. program with that too. So, um, you know, we're really proud of what our, st our students and our staff do here. Um, and if you've been a part of our community, you probably have noticed the difference. So thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about our, our uh, math focus for this year. So um, we've spent, like Ms. Walker said, two thirds of our staff spent the summer, those two weeks, thinking about standards, creating assessments, and really digging into it. And we also had them cre um, going to the KCM math training and strategies. So that was a time where our Kentucky Center of Mathematics came and trained our staff. So, uh, and again, staff across the district. So um, they're implementing that. That's what we're focused on, is implementing those strategies and skills that they learned um, this summer. We spent a lot of time talking about intentional planning. There are seven components that we're focused on when they're creating their lesson plans, and we're making sure that if you're planning this activity, what standard is it connected to, and what's the mastery that you're going to do to check for mastery? What's that tool you're going to use to check for mastery? Um, we also are implementing with math, math a pre and post. We're really focused on the pre-assessments and the post-assessments so that we are making sure that we are very intentional and we're gathering the data so that we can differentiate as we need to. Um, so what we're going to continue this quarter is to continue to track that data so that we see if what we're doing is working and if it's not, well, what are we going to change so that we can make improvements. We're also focused on real world activities, whether it's a problem solving, whether it's a hands-on task. Um, and that's why really last year we spent a lot of time focused on the reading and the writing component because we want to make sure that, you know, everything they do, they can explain themselves through their words and through their writing. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time, we created exemplars last year of our opinion writing. And so this year um, we're going to also focus on a narrative exemplar we're going to create out of our own school and then, of course, our informational exemplars. So, um, you know, with math, it's, it's the same, um, same focus. Everything's going to be intentional. What we do in math is intentional. What we do in reading and writing is going to be very intentional. So you can tell, you know, even last year, we went from 9% of us on level or, or above until the end at 53%, which that's kind of deceiving because our third, fourth, fifth, they took that uh, last I ready um, before spring break or right after spring break. So there were still three or four weeks of instruction that occurred there. Um, so right now, currently, as a school, the data we've collected so far, 63% are on mastery of the standards we've taught so far this school year. So again, we, we, know, we, uh, we know where we are and we know where we need to be, and so that's why we can have those, those intentional conversations in our design labs with each other. Um, again, I can't say enough about my staff, their dedication to our students and to their professional growth. Um, again, I'm, I'm blown away and I'm blessed and privileged to get to work with them every day. So, I think, speaking of staff, I think yeah. it was 100% of staff at Bloomfield Elementary School last year reported positive engagement on the mid-year needs assessment. So it was the highest in our district. Yeah. Only school with 100% of staff that met that mark. Yeah, yeah. Again, I, I'm, I'm, I have a wonderful staff who care about the kids. That's why each of us are here. Um, so, Ms. Hope, Ms. It's all you now. I just want to take a minute to reiterate all that was said about their math and reading instruction and the time and energy they put in every day. I was here today during their design labs, and Miss Ann runs a tight ship. So when they're in there, they're focused, they're ready to go, they're thinking about data, they're talking about kids, they're talking about what the kid knew and what they didn't know. They're naming kids and they're saying, this is what we're going to do to help those kids. So it's a really good when I'm here and I'm in classrooms and everyone's excited. Everyone's happy to be here. The kids are happy to be here. And there's just a lot going on that's good at Bloomfield and that's due to her leadership team and every teacher that's put in the work. Um, a lot of teachers here have actually helped us in the district um, as leaders. Ms. Kara Kays recently led a backpack day in, at, uh, right after fall break, some writing for all the teachers three through five. So they've really been working since 2019 on their writing plan and they've, hu they've seen huge payoffs from that. So really we're just uh, working with them too 
to embody that across the district. So we thank you, Bloomfield, for your leadership and celebrate you because you're doing a lot of great things and we appreciate you. So, Ms. Doherty, Ms. Cox, can you just briefly explain this 9% to 53%? We, and this is just to clarify for the audience, uh, today in uh, the world we live in, people like to use data as a part of uh, an agenda. And this data right here, it said 9% at the beginning of 2022, 2023, and 53% in the spring. Uh, we just took recent baseline already already scores. So um, before people post this on the internet and you know try to make fun of our school like they did last year, we want to clarify this a little bit. So Ms. Newton and I are going to talk about this a little bit more later, how iReady is um, set up. But basically, when you see that fall score, the green means those are skills of that grade level that's already been mastered. So if I'm a fourth grade student coming in and I've already mastered fourth grade standards, then I am green. If I'm yellow, which you'll see in a little bit, means it on iReady it says one grade level behind, but that just means that I've mastered the standards of the previous grade level. So when we see that 9%, that's just 9% of kids had already mastered standards of the grade level they were coming into. And then at the end, 53% of those had been mastered. So again, like Ms. Ann said, no, we're not where we want to be, but when we look at that spring score, that's what we're using to determine, hey, this is how our instruction worked in the ways that we need to think about where, what areas we need to continue to improve in. But that's basically mastery of grade level, so that fall 9%, not necessarily 9% proficient distinguished or anything like that, it's just 9% of mastery on the grade level standards that they are entering, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. So our second benefit is our communication to our school community. And what we're focused on is to what degree do our students feel safe, cared for, and a sense of belonging. So I'm going to have um, our assistant principal, Ms. Kayla Garrett, come up and discuss that. Good evening. Like she said, I'm Kayla Garrett, and I'm blessed to be the assistant principal here at Bloomfield Elementary School. I'm going to speak about our community connections. One initiative that we have had, as I'm sorry, as Ms. Cox had talked about, we have had a lot of opportunities this summer for educational opportunities. Um, so something this summer that we were able to have the opportunity partic to participate in was trauma-informed training and best practices. So we worked with uh, Ms. Stacy Holderman within our district, and we had a local trauma team here at Bloomfield Elementary School that received uh, training this summer across with other ac with other schools across the district so that was very exciting and then we thought you know this is a need that we need at Bloomfield Elementary School so we said we need all of our staff trained so we have been working with uh, Miss Lockwood she is one of our mental health uh, clinical mental health therapist and she serves some of our students here at Bloomfield Elementary School so she has been training our staff on on the practices so that's been very exciting and even today she was here and we saw a need that each classroom needs like a calming corner, a space, because through our training we have realized that students sometimes need that time to have a calm space. So she was even working with teachers on looking at their calming corners and spaces. So that was very energizing to see and exciting to see within our classrooms. Um, this summer we also had the opportunity to engage and, uh, to engage and learn uh, Kagan engagement strategies and what that and all of our teachers um, in our building did this and what Kagan strategies are are engagement strategies that teachers use in the classroom to help keep students engaged so for example after fall break I was in a kindergarten classroom and one of the Kagan strategies is called take off and touch down so they were talking about you know fall break and they also use it for social skills and things too in the classroom. And the teacher was like, okay, on fall break, if you went to the pumpkin patch, take off. So they'd be in their seat and then they, they stand up and take off. So that was exciting to see. The kids were excited, engaged, and they liked to see what their peers also participated in. So that helped build some peer relationships as well. So we have really enjoyed seeing the Kagan strategies as we link into classrooms and see what's going on. 
Also, another initiative that we have here at Bloomfield Elementary School is that we are impactful leaders. So this is somewhat in its infancy, um, and we are working on building some clarity around that and around our values. So we have LEAD values, which stand for Lead by Example, Enrich Our Community, Awaken Passions, and Dare to Change the World. So and we've also had dis discussions with students about what these values look like. So we have been building that in. And also, we have really focused on student-led events here at Bloomfield Elementary School because we want our students to be impactful leaders and know that they have a voice and a say-so and that they can help plan events. So actually, recently, our students helped plan Grandparents' Night, which was super successful, and we probably had, I would say, 150 people in this building that night. So that was very exciting to see and it was all student led and student planned. So we are very proud of the work and the initiative of our teachers and our staff and students here at Bloomfield Elementary School and our community connections. So now it's time for the real stars of the show as our students are impactful leaders and I'm gonna have them talk to you. Thank you. Someone, someone once said that a go without a plan is called a dream. My name is Jackson Mattingly. I'm a fifth grader at Bloomfield Elementary. And I'm going to tell you how our leadership team had a go we had turn into Grandparents' Night. Grandparents' Night was a night for the students of Bloomfield Elementary to spend time with their grandparents. But before we could just ask everybody to show up, we had to plan it first. Every plan has steps that you must take. The first step our leadership team took was to split up into three groups. These three groups all had different purposes. The first group was in charge of music. This group would meet up in the school's library. We would get on the computers and look for 50s and 60s type music. We would go through the music and decide the best songs that were on there. The second group came up with the invitations to the band came up with the invitations. We wanted it to be special, so the group chose the best looking invitations. The second group came up with, the, the third group came up and was in charge of the night's fun filled activities. Some of the activities included scrapbooking, bingo, and pictures taken with your grandparents. It was a night of fun and laughter. It was a night to show grandma and grandpa how much we love them and appreciate them. We tried to show them how much we loved them and we wanted to take a night to do something for them. But anybody who has a grandparent knows that they won't let you pamper them for long. They always have to give you something back. And guess what? Just like always, they did. After it was over, the grandparents left, but not before leaving something behind. Now sometimes grandparents forget their car keys, maybe sometimes their glasses. But on this night, they left something very important with us to take forever. First, we could take the memory of the night, and second, we could take some words of wisdom that they, words of wisdom that they left. On a big piece of poster paper, the grandparents wrote short quotes and words of wisdom for all of us to take with us in the middle school and beyond. So with the hard work of the leadership team, the art team, and some teachers, our, grand, our dream of grandparents' night became a great success. Thank you all for letting me share it, share it with you. It was a great honor. My name is Layla Summit. I am a third grade student at Bloomfield Elementary School. I'm a member of the leadership group at Bloomfield Elementary. We have just started planning a fall math literacy night. We are reviewing math activities to see what materials will be needed and how many people might attend. We plan to include a, a variety of activities that are simple to complete and will help students with math skills. Thank you for listening. So that's, that's our story and, and um, you know, we'll, we'll continue to tell our story and move forward and, 
and uh, collect that data and keep pushing forward. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sam. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, our next item is a student and stakeholder engagement, public comment. Thank you for attending our Nelson County School Board meeting. Any person wishing to address the board may do so by following these rules. Individual representing themselves are allowed three minutes. Individual representing a group are limited to five minutes. Please step forward, state your name and address. And if you're representing a group, state the name of the group and are representing. First thing I need to say is there was a sheet of paper back there that the state has sent and those that didn't get it, you can pass around what is it. It's telling you, you do not point out one particular board member. You are supposed to address the board as a whole and not by individual. And I know we've been doing that incorrectly, but someone from the state sent that to me, so I'm not sure can what's going on. Yeah, can I see that? You sure can. Okay. Okay, uh, there is a uh, Nicole Melbourne. She signed up weeks and weeks ago. And just to be clear, we're doing 30 minutes. Everyone still agree to the 30 minutes? We don't want to hear everybody on the list, right? <laughs> right. Okay, Nicole's name, address, and. Hold on, there's a problem with the timer, I think. Excuse me? There's a problem with the timer, I think. Are you ready? No. Yes. Okay. Okay. As she said, my name is Nicole Milburn. Um, I live at 1035 Hon Ridge Road, Bloomfield, Kentucky. Speak into the microphone, please. Okay. To say that we are proud of our Bloomfield Elementary School would be an understatement. As a parent, we should be focused on our students. Our focus shouldn't be on all the issues that all the parents grandparents, everybody else that is wanting to take up all of the time for these meetings and make them last four to five hours. Um, I understand that a lot of these numbers that um, are students in these buildings that are down and that they're expensive. I'm not sure how we're supposed to approve a mechanics building when we're currently already have a mechanics building at the ATC. Um, I feel like we're getting thrown a, like you would throw a dog a bone, you know, it's one of those things like, well, we're going to close it anyway, so here, we'll, we'll appease you. Here, let's have this. I'd like for the board to be honest, stop giving us excuses. I'd like to know exactly what the plan is, what the plan is for our students, what the plan is for the future. Have we come up with a game plan for our students? How does our district plan to go forward to be better for our students? One of the things I would like to say is um, I was informed last week that um, we got recognized at a meeting that I attended with Kentucky Farm Bureau um, for um, one of the teacher, what would you call it? It was like an apprenticeship for Western. I thought that was pretty amazing. Um, Courtney Newton and Laura Arnold were a part of that. So thank you very much. Something else that I think that needs to be addressed is for everybody that has complained about our board members that are sitting on the board currently, I think everybody needs to remember that we voted for them, each and every one of us. We may not like it, but we did it. 
pointing fingers and calling names and making such a fuss is not beneficial to them or us. They're not getting anywhere with it. I prefer that we all act like adults. I know in the beginning I didn't. Two years ago, I stood and made a fool of myself because I took it as a threat because my children were going to be affected. So I get it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sarah Dusk. 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 Yes, no. Okay. Next speaker, Bill Osborne. Speaking for a group, Madam Chairman, the Osborne 97. Okay. Five minutes. Okay, to start, I want to thank this board for everything that you have endured over the last 10 months. I, it's got to be tough. You know, we're all about, we're all on the same page here, people. It's about educating our children in this county. I've been a part of this county as a freshman in my, my freshman year in 1969 70. And I didn't stop there. I have volunteered. I've drove a school bus. I've served two meet, uh, terms on the board. Nelson County Schools has a special place in my heart. And uh, as I've met with people over the last month or so to try to get some idea on where the community stands, and I know we've heard several opinions in here, but I had one guy ask me, he said, your kids are, have, are grown and graduated. Your grandkids are not here. Why on earth are you still a part of this? I said, well, as long as they send me that tax bill every October, I'm going to stand up for what I think is right. So anyway, I've looked at all the proposals, and I was here in the 69-70 school year when we first merged Nelson County, New Haven, and Bloomfield. It was a small task, but nothing like we've heard over the last several months. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and just give you some thoughts of mine after reviewing this and looking at where academically we stand. We've got a problem in this county, people. And if you deny it, then you need to open your eyes. We have got to educate our children. And, and I think all this started, when I left the board in 2006, we had purchased the Hutchins property. And I was told by the director of finance at that time that it's going to be 20 years. We, we're, our bonding potential is gone. We built the school that we're standing in here tonight, Old Kentucky Home, uh, Boston School. We built the central office. We built the academy. We built the uh, 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 preschool. And I'm proud of every building that we've put up. But as we look across our district, we have hundreds of empty seats. Now, as taxpayers, you know, everybody in this room will agree, we don't have a problem paying our school tax. Education is important, and without this tax, it can't be done. But we have got to be smart, and we've, we've looked at the, uh, the uh, community schools, and, and by now, we all know it's not going to happen. Not with this current board sitting here, it's not going to happen. And that's taken away from our children. So. I'm going to go back and, and just give you some thoughts on where I stand after spending over 50 years involved with this school system. Most of you are not even that old. But with the current enrollment that we are, are looking at in our school system, and as a board member, we're probably down close to 1,000 students uh, today as, as to, uh, compared to where we were at when I was a board member, over 5,000 students. We've got. The $10 million renovation at the Up Center, which is going to be one of the greatest things that's ever happened to this county. So basically, when we get done, we're going to have two high schools on that campus. We're going to have room for probably 400 students. The school, the capacity, and we, right now, I think we're right at 1,400 students, maybe a little north or south of that. So with the, the, the dual credits, the co-ops, the vocational school, people, Hardin County has four high schools and what, 16,000 students. 
we have four high schools in, in Nelson County with Barkstown and Bethlehem and our two schools, and we're looking at less than, what, 8,000 students? We can't, we can't function like this. As taxpayers, we got to say, you know, we're going to give up our money, but let's be smart when we spend it. So my, my proposal would be to merge the high schools back together, two or three elementary schools, I mean, not elementary schools, but middle schools or even junior highs. When I was in high school, or junior high, we had seven, eight, and nine in the building. It worked great for us. So let's put all our differences aside and as a community come together and try to do what's best for our community. Uh, you know, we talked last month about we're going to be short lots of money down the road. So we've got, as, as, as educators, as community pillars, we've got to figure out how to move this school district forward and, 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 and get this, put this to bed. Our students, our kids deserve better than what we've shown them over the last 10 months. In closing, I just want to thank the board. You guys, your skin has got to be tough. And, I, and I, I've been there. I appreciate everything you've done, and I hope we can get through this. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, our next speaker is Elizabeth Luther. Okay. Next speaker, Emma, I think I got Emma and Lily. My name is Lily Miller. I'm currently a sophomore at Thomas Nelson. Can Tom you speak in the... Thomas Nelson is my school. It's our school. I have pride in my school and love my high school. Why do you want to take that away from us? I play varsity softball at Thomas Nelson. Thomas Nelson has 25 girls that play softball. Nelson County has 20 to 25. If the teams are combined, that would be at least 50 girls. At least 20 girls would have to be cut. Nelson County is not going to cut their girls. These cuts will include all sports. Kids need to be involved in their schools. I have found my passion in softball and what it means to be really a part of something. If I go to Nelson County, I will no longer have that. Why are you wanting to take that away from us? Students will become a number by combining those high schools. Are teachers going to be able to get to know their students and what students need? I barely have time to ask questions in class now. If you add us to bigger classes in Nelson County, it will be that much harder to get into what individualized help that we need. There's a rivalry between Thomas Nelson and Nelson County. I'm a triplet. My brother and sister attend Nelson County. If you can, I attend Thomas Nelson. If you can only imagine the arguments that we have with two kids at Nelson County and me at Thomas Nelson, it is very bad. Combining the schools will have a negative impact on mental health. How are the mental health needs and discipline needs going to be met? There has to be a better solution than combining the two high schools. All right, she left me quite a bit of time to talk here. So I'm Clay Bowman. I'm the softball coach out Thomas Nelson. Uh, the girls after last meeting went home, signed up to sit up and talk. So I've got enough time here. I'm going to do a little recognition too. Emma O'Daniel, our senior up here, uh, she just signed a scholarship for Georgetown College. So. Just want to publicly congratulate her. And then I could have a hundred talking points on, but I'm gonna go in a little bit more about Lily's story. Um, she went through Bloomfield here, come over to Thomas Nelson to play basketball. Hadn't played softball ever. Uh, I took the softball job last fall and we was gonna be short on numbers. So I started looking for girls inside the school that may give it a try. Uh, my son had coached basketball at Bloomfield Middle School, so he introduced me to a few of the girls that had come over from Bloomfield. Uh, long story short, I met them, talked to her parents. 
it took me three or four weekends of meeting with just two or three girls out in the indoor facility and their parents letting them try softball out to see if they would even enjoy and see if they think they'd be good enough to play. Uh, so far out of them three girls, I still got them three and I picked up two or three more from that initial three. Uh, Lily had a great season. We got to district tournament. She hadn't played since T-ball and the kid was her starting first baseman on the softball team. Uh, she probably made the biggest defensive play we made all year long in the district tournament. Had a couple of hits in RBI. Made all district team. Had we had, had a combined school, I wouldn't even have been looking for kids. I would have had enough kids to pick from. It wouldn't ever have took a chance on begging a kid that hadn't played since T-ball to come play softball for us. Um, we would be robbing kids of that opportunity. I have another girl that had just moved into the district when she had been in there a year, so last year was her second year in the district, had moved here from out of state. She had, was still trying to find herself. She had gotten in trouble at school. Me and her had butted heads all year long. And we still butt heads. Me and her is just alike. We're competitive, we're hard headed, but she is my biggest leader on my team this year that has made the biggest turnaround. She made me two dozen cookies for Foster Heights for Pride Games. And this is the kid that was in trouble, wasn't getting very good grades. She called me yesterday, she was gonna miss practice to take some kind of veterinarian test with FFA after school. She's excited about school. That would have been a kid that had we had combined school and had 50 kids to choose from that would have got pushed aside. That you wouldn't have gave a second chance to. So that's just some of the stories. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Deborah Bocheski. Deborah Bohachevsky, I'm speaking on behalf of a group, um, Save Our Nelson County Schools, and I live in Bloomfield, Kentucky. At this point, I don't think there's anything that I or anyone else can say that is going to persuade anyone's mind. We've been having discussions for two and a half years now, and sure, there's been a few people that have um, changed their viewpoints, but we are so far deep into this discussion, I, I don't see anything changing tonight. So instead, well, sorry, I want to backtrack. Bloomfield Elementary, fantastic job raising those test scores. Phenomenal. Um, back on track. I'm not going to discuss why we should have Bloomfield Middle School stay open or one high school or two high schools. Not tonight. Instead, I'm going to be like David. David had five stones in his pocket when he went to slay Goliath. Well, one for each school board member. How about that? Just kidding. Um, we don't need to be on the news again tonight. Um, but instead, what I'm going to do is put my trust in the Lord. I have researched and spoken with a legislative and biblical law expert. And while the school board can't say a prayer at a school board meeting, from the research that I've done and the expert that I checked with, there's nothing to say that a person can't pray during a public comment. So if you feel so inclined, please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask that you watch over this school building tonight, that you watch over this crowd and ease some of the anxiety that is in everybody's hearts tonight, Lord. We know there's major decisions going on tonight. Please watch over our school board, have them make the right decisions for the student body of Nelson County. Please let the differences that are in this county 
Wayne, let this school district come back together, Lord. We all are here for the children, and it's in your name that we pray that we bring peace to our county. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, <laughs> uh, Tiffany Clark. Tiffany Clark, principal at the New Haven School, Springfield, Kentucky. It is with a deep sense of urgency and commitment that we address the challenges faced by a significant population of students within our school district, a population that has long been underserved due to ongoing inequities. These students find themselves grappling with academic difficulties and more profoundly, the need to be seen, known, and supported. It is imperative that we recognize and confront these issues head on, striving for a more equitable future for all members within our community. In our pursuit of academic excellence, we must acknowledge that our district is far from a level playing field. There are students who, throw, who know at no fault of their own have encountered barriers that impede their educational process. Progress, excuse me. These barriers can manifest in numerous forms, from limited access to educational resources and quality teaching, to systematic biases that disproportionately affect certain groups. But the heart of the issue goes beyond test scores and report cards. It lies within our students' deep desire to be seen and known as individuals, not just as statistics. We must make it our mission to know each student personally, to understand their unique strengths, challenges, and dreams. It is about recognizing that every student comes from a different background, many of which are very different than ours, with diverse family structures, needs, and support systems. To truly support our underserved students, we must also acknowledge that we need to understand their families. We must be familiar with the makeup of their households, the challenges they face, and the strengths they bring to the table. We must see their parents, guardians, and caregivers as partners in our students' educational success and not as distant entities that are merely a component of their academic journeys. Our commitment to equity extends to finding meaningful ways to support each family, recognizing that the road to success is unique for every child. It's about actively engaging with these families, working collaboratively to create a nurturing and empowering educational environment. This means providing resources and programs that cater to specific needs of our underserved students, breaking down the structural barriers that hinder their success every single day and ensure that all families have a voice and a stake in their education as well as their students. We must create a school district where every student is seen, known, and supported, and where the family's makeup is valued and understood. Let us stand united in our dedication to equity, ensuring that no student is left behind, that every child can reach their full potential. I ask that each decision that is made tonight and in the future is taken into consideration our undeserved or underserved population. If we make our decisions based on that population, everybody wins. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jessica Ho. Yes. Three minutes? Yes. Okay. Oh, one moment. <clears throat> Hi, um, I'm Jessica Hoke. I didn't know if I was going to make the cut, so I didn't really prepare anything. Um, I just, you know, there's a lot going on, um, a lot of talk about, you know, are we going to go to one high school? Um, is the board going to vote on this? And um, really all I have to say to the board members, I know that this has not been easy for anybody. Um, I just hope that if a vote is coming tonight, in the future, to merge two high schools back together, putting 1,500 kids under one roof, 
that you can look these kids in the eye, so if you vote to merge these high schools back together, that you can go to Thomas Nelson High School and Nelson County High School and look these kids in the eyes and tell them that you did this because it's what was best for every single student. If you go to a one middle school um, option, I really hope that you can um, provide some facts on why that you think that that's the best idea. Um, and, you know, Ms. Milburn, I 100% agree with you. I would like to know a plan. I would like to know a solid plan that's backed by facts um, that truly is the best for every single student in our district. I think the community is at a point now where let's stop stalling and let's make a plan that the community can actually get behind and let's actually have some um, community input. So instead of you know going to a vote to one high school without it being thought through, let's have some community forums and let's invite everybody to the table. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Katie Brown. My name is Katie Brown. I live in LaRue County, and I'm also the school counselor at New Haven School. Um, I debated on which topic really, like where to even start, but it all goes back to really the time invested, time wasted, and the people impacted. We're talking about leaders of livelihoods here, students sitting around wondering about what their near future holds, parents and guardians uncertain about what ne next year looks like for their children, how will this impact their lives, their everyday routines. All of these same concerns, among many others, have been strung out long enough. For months upon months, we've watched and waited as nothing gets done. No one makes a move on anything. Hired professionals come, they do their paid parts, wait patiently for hours to present up on proposals for what? Nothing. It's embarrassing. And to all of them, we're sorry. We see you, we're with you, and we appreciate the work that you've been putting in for us. If it's not the fact that you don't want middle schoolers with high schoolers, or the fact that we just don't have the money to invest, or the fact that we just aren't willing to close certain schools, then what is it really? No matter what it is, it's time. It's time to make a decision. It's time to have meaningful discussions and to be completely transparent with the staff at our schools, the students at our schools, and the families at our schools. Instead, though, all we see and hear are board members saying they aren't really ready to make a vote on anything, but instead need time to flesh it out. They need time to discuss all, discuss all options. When in the world do you plan on doing these things? Stop talking about what needs to be done and actually do it. We've been hearing about it for months. We've been waiting. I feel like New Haven has just been hanging out on a ledge waiting for you to decide our fate. This is absolutely insane, tremendously unfair, and off the charts frustrating. I'm not sure, nor is anyone, because you really refuse to say when it is that you will decide to give us something. Something more than talking in circles, wasting three and four hours at a time but we are begging you to see the importance of moving us forward sooner than later. I'm not sure if you've recently taken a glimpse inside your schools and actually had meaningful conversations with the ones putting in the work, but time is ticking. It's right now the end of quarter one. We are now connecting with our leaders to discuss the success of our schools, working hard on systems, programs, curriculum maps, and all the things that provide success to our students and actually makes the school function day to day. At New Haven specifically, it's in my normal routine of duties to very soon begin preparing the master schedule for next year. Unfortunately, it's been really difficult to do this and have in-depth conversations with leaders in our buildings. They've already begun voicing concerns and have shared difficulty in planning for and investing in our school when there's so much uncertainty around the next school year. I want you to truly think about how putting this off, whatever your decisions may be, impacts all the leaders and families across Nelson County. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to try to get through these next two items and then we're going to take a 10 minute break. Okay, our next uh, item is our monthly consent agenda. 
which consists of our monthly financial report, leave of absence, minutes from previous meetings, fundraiser's request out of, uh, I'm sorry, overnight out of state field trip request, purchase of new maintenance vehicles, revised behavior procedures. Uh, I think there's a comment to be made about our minutes of the previous meeting. Yes. I move to amend the minutes at the September 19, 2023 meeting to reflect that the motion to vote on one high school made, the motion to table that motion, and the motion to adjourn immediately after the motion to table were not acted on appropriately under Robert's Rules of Order. However, no action resulted from those three motions, and they are deemed void. Thank you. Okay, with that being said, do I hear a motion to approve of our monthly consent agenda? I'm sorry. Oh, oh, okay, I'm sorry. I need a motion to, um, okay, uh, for the uh, call for the amendment of that motion, correct? Yes, call second. Okay, I had a motion made by, yes, Ms. Deaton, mm -hmm. uh -huh, was in there, and second by uh, Ms. Bowling. All in favor? Uh, Aye. All opposed? Motion carried. Okay, now I need a mo uh, motion for to approve our monthly consent agenda. I make a motion. Thank you, Ms. Bowling. Do I hear a second? Second. Second by Mr. Norman. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carry. Our next item is our annual state and federal compliance, and that is our personnel notifications, and that is a no action um, uh, moment. Uh, we're just notification, as it says. The next is our school calendar committee, and that's by Alex Martin. Quickly. Better. Sit uh, present here. So at, at our last meeting, we approved our calendar committee. Uh, this is the timeline that we intend to follow. We did meet on October 9th. Uh, at our first meeting, and we do plan to meet next week. And really, our intentions are to bring to you a calendar for the 24 25 school year at our November meeting. So, really, we just started with some value driven questions. If I were to summarize these uh, very quickly, um, really, it's where are we finding the most value with our time? Really, what's working well? Where could we see some potential adjustments? Um, and you can see some of the responses from the folks on our committee. Um, currently, this is, this is a draft. Um, so, and there are a few adjustments we want to make here, but essentially what we have currently for our 23-24 uh, school year, this is a copy of that essentially. Um, so really I made this copy for the team to study. And again, the questions are, where are we finding the most value with our time? The question that always comes up every year is really the balance of backpack days. So the way to describe that is, is really we're trying to study our allocation of our teacher resources. We, our teachers are, are contracted 186 days, four of those days are holidays, and 170 are instructional days. So essentially you have 12 staff planning days that you can work with, um, and, and we've talked about maybe, maybe can we get more of those? But the balance is, is we like those at the beginning, and we'd also like those sprinkled throughout, but at the end of the day you only have 12. So how do we get the most value out of that is really our question. That's what we're going to explore next week, and we'll have um, a proposal for you in, in November. Any questions? The only, Mr. Martin, the only question I might have, and I, and I think it, it is this way, but I know one of the goals last year was start to be a little bit more consistent on the, the time frame of the start of school in August, you know, early versus late versus mid. Right. Um, if I'm looking at this so far, just this kind of sample working document, it does look like we're trying to keep to that promise. The last several years we've started mid-August has really been kind of that start time, and uh, according to our teams, that feels about right, really. Okay. Anybody, anybody have any comment or anything? Okay, fine job. Thank you. Okay, our next update would be our grant acceptances and update, and that's Ms. Jessica Shearhorn. Good evening. I'll start off with some good news. We were recently awarded a grant from the Office of Justice Programs in the amount of $487,309 across a three-year grant period ending in September of 2026. And this grant um, will continue support to support increased school safety through coordination 
of services, consultation, and collaboration among school staff, community stakeholders, and law enforcement personnel to improve school climate and positive responses to student behavior. Okay. So I ask that you accept this grant award as presented. Okay, I need a motion to accept our first grant as accepted. Quick. Motion. Motion. Quick, uh, quick question, is it to approve the grant application or approve receiving it? We have actually been awarded okay. this grant. So uh, you are approving the receipt and use of that fund, those funds. Okay, I had a motion by uh, Mr. Norman. Do I hear a second? Second. Okay. Mr. Jackie, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carried. Okay, our next one. Okay, on the second one, this is just um, permission to submit a grant um, for a Diesel Fuels Emission Reduction Act um, in the amount of approximately 125000 for the purchase of four new school buses to replace ones that are 2009 or older to assist in the reduction of diesel fuel emissions into the atmosphere. And I can tell you really know that, don't you? But it sounds really good. Oh, we're gonna get it. <laughs> oh, I know we will. Okay, I need a motion to, uh, to apply for this Diesel Emissions Reduction Act in the amount of 125,000. Motion. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'll second it. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Motion made, yeah, by Ms. Deaton, second by uh, Ms. Bowling. All in favor? Uh -huh. Aye. All opposed? Motion carried. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. How long you want the break to be? Five minutes. Okay, I need a motion to recess for 10 minutes, please. Motion. Yeah. We've got two again. Okay, yes. we've got Ms. Bowling made the motion and Ms. Deaton seconded. All in favor? Uh, All opposed? We will uh, adjourn at 5 p we'll come back in order at 5 10. Uh, 10 till.
Motion. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Bowling made the motion. I hear a second. Second. Mr. Norman seconded. Uh, thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay, motion carried. Okay. Our next item is our strategic decision making. First, we have uh, next gen assessment update and dashboard by Hope Daughtry and Courtney Newton. So I just want to provide some context of why this is on the agenda. Um, as discussed last week, Diane, you shared just more clarity around iReady data. This is a bit of an overview of some of that information. Also in November, state testing comes out. This talks a little bit about our process we're using internally um, that acknowledges some of that data, but acknowledges some of the other data we're working with as a school district. Um, as you know, there's, there's a, a lot of confusion around some of this information. We want to continue to build capacity of our team to uh, increase awareness of that as we move into November. I'll just go ahead and start. Our first slide's just about celebrating people. Um, as many of you know, as many of you might know, I just took this job late June, 1st of July, and part of the reason I took this job was just the excitement and the commitment of the leaders across Nelson County. So I was able to work with them through challenge teams um, in the spring and then in summer pathways in the summer, and just everyone's excitement and everyone's willingness and everyone's commitment to learning and student growth was just exciting for me. It was a challenge for me, so that was one of the main reasons that I was ready to take on this role. So we've been really um, blessed, Courtney and I, we get to work in schools daily in design labs and in classrooms and just going in and seeing what people are doing every day in the trenches and it's really nice to be able to see the work paying off that we've put forth over this past year. And so we just want to take a minute just to celebrate that work. We're going to kind of walk you through that just a little bit. But um, our leaders are committed. They're putting in the work. And it's exciting to see. So we are going to both share a little bit about our process around educating our students and our schools, um, our next-gen assessments, and give you all some updates on some data as well. Um, so I think that it was requested of us to look at iReady specifically within our data, but I wanted to give some context for all the different data that we utilize uh, just to see if students are growing. So it's best practice not to use one form of data. You're supposed to use multiple data sets to determine how students are growing, in what ways, and what supports that they need. Um, and in our school district, we use really three different layers of data to determine where students are and what we need to do instructionally. So we use local data points, that's weekly signals, so that's student data week to week, how students are doing in the classroom. We discuss those in design labs. There are interim assessments. Our um, high schools did those just today um, at the local school level. Those are ACT aligned. There are school-wide writing. Our high schools just did those, and our middle schools are preparing to do those very soon. And we have quarterly community assessments. So those are the assessments that we built this summer that are aligned to the Kentucky State Standards, but we also did a lot of the things like looking at some of those hidden standards that exist within test. So as you'll notice in these state and national um, tests here, they all have different standards that they're aligned to. So even if we're teaching the state standards, it doesn't necessarily show how they need to demonstrate that on the ACT or the KSA or the PSAT 89. We could list all those tests that they have to go through. So um, our community assessments look at state standards. They look at some of those hidden standards and how our students have to demonstrate that knowledge. Then we have state assessments. Those scores, as Mr. Bradley said, come out in November, I think November 1st. Um, and then we have national data that we look at as well. So national data points being iReady diagnostics, those are based on common core standards. And then we have the ACT, our sophomores just took that today. Uh, that's based on college and career readiness standards from the ACT. And then we have uh, PSCT 89, which is based on college board and common core standards. So those are all the different layers, and uh, we're gonna spend the next couple of minutes just looking at iReady specifically, because our students took the fall diagnostic for iReady. 
So the fall diagnostic is like a pretest. So a lot of times when teachers start a unit, they'll give a pretest, and that's over stuff they have not taught yet, just to see what do we know, what don't we know, what do we need to dig more into, and what can we pass over. So this fall diagnostic is a pretest, meaning, and I think Hope talked a little bit about this with BES, that means those standards that are on that test are not supposed to be learned until May 2024. So this is a pretest. So when we have the students in the green here, this is with our math. This is district-wide. This is national year-to-date fall diagnostic. So this is all the students across the nation that take iReady, the fall diagnostic. This is our district. This data point right here is pre-COVID. This is 1819 national norms. The students in the green here are students who are already demonstrating standards that have not yet been taught because they're not supposed to have learned those technically until May 2024. The students in yellow are students who are, they're saying that they're one grade below, but they're not really below because they haven't learned that material yet. So they're right where they need to be. Um, iReady has helped us with this data to put this together, and they've also kind of explained to us the purpose and uh, how these students are lining up here. So when we look at the students in the red, some of these students might have one area that they need additional support in. Uh, they might have two areas. They might be really strong in math and not in reading, vice versa. But the power of this data is not just these percentage points. It's because we get these reports on students that show exactly what category, what student, what they need to have happen. And our schools have those plans in place to make sure those students are growing throughout the year. So Hope's going to tell you guys a little bit about the elementary mathematics fall diagnostic. So, that was kind of loud. Uh, just like Courtney said, when we think about math, there's four domains of math. So really what we're using this data for is to see which domains that I need to work on as a teacher. So when I think about, if I look at fifth grade, we got 16 and 7 percent the national year to date, which is the, all the kids who took it in the nation in the fall right now the same as our kids did. So you can see kind of the comparison there. Um, but basically what we use that for is to see when I get ready to teach, say, um, a unit on volume, I can look at this and it goes really into detail of which kids have mastered volume already, which kids are ready, and which kids need extra support. So that's kind of where those green, yellow, and red come from. My green already have, my yellow are ready to go, and my red are going to need some extra support. And then it even gives me the supports that I can use to help them. So when you look through here, I'm not going to go through every one of those. I'll just kind of let you view it. Um, you can see we're kind of right in line with the rest of the nation taking this year to date. Again, those are saying the green are the standards that kids have already mastered for the grade level they just entered. So that's just kind of how that's laid out. Same thing with six, seven, and eight. And then reading is the same thing. So reading's broken down into five areas where math was four areas. Again, this is district-wide, district versus national year to date. Um, and it's laid out the same way as far as how we determine if a kid falls in the green, yellow, or red area. And this looks like pre-COVID, basically the nation and the district are back to the same, relatively one or two percent away from pre-COVID levels. And that's actually exactly what, when we met with the iReady rep, that they were talking about, that we were back where we were, and they're actually working on a new national norm and what that looks like, and that'll be coming out pretty soon. Again, reading, same setup showing you over the um, grade levels what that looks like. You'll notice in kindergarten there aren't any red just because they don't have a year or two years behind. So that's kind of misleading sometimes to people. Even when we look at it, we got to remember, oh, there's no red. We're like, yay, but they're like, oh, there can't be. <laughs> so that's something to think about. And six, seven, and eighth again. So really, just to reiterate, we're pretty much right on track with the nation right now as far as where students are, where they're entering into our grades um, right now. And it's, it's good to have awareness compared to the national norm. Um, and it's also good to have awareness for each individual student, which I want to stress is really the power out of taking things like the diagnostic and the pretest, which is the, the, what they just took. 
as we can see exactly where the kids are according to this hour ready, we can make strategic plans according to that. Um, so again, across the board, no matter what grade level it is in reading or math, we're pretty much right on track, pretty much the same amount in green, um, pretty much the same amount in yellow, a little bit less in red is really the pattern that we could see for the I ready across the board there. Right. I think it's safe to say we, we're not where we want to be, but that this is an indicator that we are returning to where we were and increasing strengthening. So before I move on from I ready, questions from you all about I ready specifically, because I know that was the request. Okay, so um, I wanted to go into a little bit about the local assessments. Some of your all students might have said that they took some assessments before fall break. Those were those community assessments. Um, so we have community assessments that were taken. I explained earlier how those were aligned and created through those summer leadership pathways. They are standards aligned. They are also aligned to the types of ways they will be asked to demonstrate that knowledge as well. Uh, just giving students practice on that. Now what's really cool about the system that uh, we designed and Alex was really instrumental in helping us create this platform here. But every teacher has access to a sheet or to a Google uh, website. It shows exactly where their students are on those assessments. So they can see this is the student, these are the standards that they mastered, these are the questions that they mastered, um, and this is the trends that I'm seeing as a teacher so I can make instructional decisions beyond that. So every teacher has access to their class and they can also see trends across the district within a content area. So if I'm working at a middle school level, I can work with the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade teachers together and talk about how we need to build those skills up to make sure that all of those students are growing. We also have uh, weekly signals. Those are student data based on formative assessments happening in the classroom each week. So this is the work of a PLC. Teachers get together and talk about how are students this week, what did they learn, what did they not, what are we going to do about it, is really those questions that we focus on in design labs. So all the design labs, which are uh, professional learning communities that are coming together each week to look at student data and how our students are growing. These are some examples of some of the data that we looked at during the backpack day. Um, so the first day back from fall break was a, a teacher work day called a backpack day, and we got together in content areas. And within those content areas, 6, 12, and then elementary, we looked at how our students did by power standard. So what are the skills? How did they do with those across the board? We looked at by question. So as a teacher, it's beneficial to see, is there something about that question um, that students had difficulties with? Is there a language piece? What is it? That way we can make sure that we address those things that students need more support with. Uh, we also have lots of writing data at this point. We're doing writing across the curriculum so we can see where our students are writing by skill set and also within the different content areas because you write for different purposes in there. So we've got lots of data that our teachers have access to that they're collecting to know what students are learning and how they are growing. Elementary looks just a little bit different. These are the domains I was referring to earlier with iReady number and operations, algebraic thinking, measurement data, and geometry. So for math, what we're doing is using these standard reportings this is kind of what that looks like. It shows me in grade four at this specific school that 27 kids have already mastered that skill, zero are progressing and 51 have not. And then it will give me um, what I need to work with with those kids. So they're just ready for me to teach that standard. That kind of shows you where that green comes from, showing that mastery. We're also tracking by power standard. So every K through five teacher has a tracking sheet that looks similar to this with their students and the standards and they are scoring them, kind of a standard based grading of one, two, three, or four on how they're doing um, on that particular standard. And then they're making decisions on what do I need to do differently or what supports do my, my students need. Um, Alex was also <laughs> instrumental in making this, but if you see at the top, this is a really long spreadsheet, but if you see the one, two, and four, that lets the teacher know which standards are the most um, needy. So like number one, 5MD5, find the volume of a right rectangular. They just taught that, but I know that only 37% of my kids mastered it, so I need to do something about that. So that's that growth piece. And then um, we can also see in this fourth grade classroom that 70% of the standards I taught have been mastered, and my students have mastered 6% of all the standards. So there's just a lot of data, like Courtney said, that we're really gathering each day, each week, each unit, each, by each unit. So um, after that, we have the reading one. It's a, I think, where did I skip it? Was there reading? Huh? It's gone. 
The reading's very similar, but we're really focusing on early literacy. So we're looking at what skills the kids need before they leave second grade to be able to read on a third grade level. That's also what the state early literacy department's looking at. So we're really honing in on what do we need to do in those five domains of reading in every day in the classroom. So we're looking at schedules, making sure teachers have time, making sure they have resources, making sure that they are capable of doing their job with what they have um, and the support that they need. So basically, teachers have really dove into that. They're working on that. They're tracking the data, and they're doing a really great job moving kids forward past each skill so they can be ready for that third grade level. So I've just got one question, mm -hmm. and if you'll go back to the literacy skills slide, uh, just to use this one as a, an example. So I'm looking down at the bottom, um, and the uh, horizontal bar graph piece, that would have been fall of 22 compared to spring of 23. Then whenever I start going across the bottom there towards the right, the two pie charts. So since we don't have uh, KSA data yet, it's not released really. We have iReady data and we have our community data, which is kind of what we look like at weekly. This shows you, this is the, actually the percent of third graders ready for grade, third grade level currently. The national average is 61. We're at 55. Our growth, that means 62% of our kids last year met their typical growth on iReady. Okay. And then that bar, that bar, the bar chart is like you said, it went from 18 to 49 of percent mastery. So is, would this be the data about the same group of students then? Meaning that the fall second graders, we now jump to that center pie chart, the left-hand pie chart. And that is the same group of students, but as a fall 23 third grader? So the fall and spring is whole, like K through five. It's really okay. a holistic score. And I just picked out third grade just because that was the one that we're trying to say, okay, we have to have kids ready by third grade. Okay. So that's kind of a focus point. And it's okay. kind of in the middle. So that's how we pick that. That's, I, I just want to make sure that, you know, as you continue to look at this and digest it, making sure to understand, is there a correlation? Is it the same sets of students? Or in this case, there's a little bit of a, a differentiation there. It's pretty much the same. It's really just to show that we are doing the things, we're moving in the right direction. It's not gonna happen overnight, but there's these little bits of growth that we see every day that's moving towards what we need. Okay, the, the only other question I'll ask, and I'll ask this one just kind of as a general one. So back at the very beginning where we were looking at um, the, yeah, as you, yeah, there you go. So as we get back into these, I, I think I kept hearing, uh, and correct me if I'm, I'm speaking it incorrectly, but as we are starting to recover out of the pandemic, we all recognize there was an impact, but we got to still deal with that impact. Did I hear that what this is starting to show us is that we are getting back onto that same um, progression that we would have hoped as far as improvement and we are also within a couple points percentage points here or there plus or minus at that national level as well yes so we're at the national norm again i mean i like to win so i like to be better than the national so we're working towards that but it, sure. it's just those pieces that we're doing that we discussed that's going to get us there so yes but we're back on track uh, where we were pre-covid we're ready to go we have the things in place and it's happening so and that also i mean i think this would also maybe indicate nationally the country is starting to get back on track or yes. we're getting on back on track with where the country is. That's maybe the better way to say it. Okay. Yeah. Well, and, and as I kind of look at, you know, the K through five, whether it's on the reading or the mathematics, you know, as you look across and not even focus on the percentages, and I think this is something that one of you made the comment about, as you just start looking at the color portions, the red, the pink, the yellow, the light green, the dark green, or 
maybe it's blue, I can't tell, um, that what it is showing is that just looking at the colored sections, there is a symmetry between us and the national numbers. Then if you look at the actual percentages, you can see that one or two percentage points typically, plus or minus. Okay. Okay, anyone else? No. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Next item is athletic and student leadership data, and that's by Mr. Martin. So we'll just provide some context on this. This is also a request uh, to share information uh, regarding athletic and student leadership participation at our high schools. So really, the request is kind of studying the, the programs that we have available. So really, we're looking at, obviously, athletics, um, student organizations, clubs, and really looking at the total participation at each of our high schools. So what does that look like at Nelson County High? What does it look like at Thomas Nelson? And then also the request is really studying certain athletic programs um, do have a kind of a max capacity. What does that look like? And then also, what does our middle school participation look like on each of those programs? So generically, that was the request. Um, I did partner with um, student leadership director uh, at, each of, at each high school, Joe Peak and uh, Matt Reynolds. But before we get into that, we're going to look at lots of numbers. I think it's just a good reminder. Ultimately, um, and this was made reference earlier, that the data looks like numbers on a page, but they do represent, uh, obviously, students, families, coaches, teams. Um, and this was a shot from our senior sponsor that was held at our recent Pride game. So just a good starting point as we take a look. And you guys may want to reference, obviously, your screen. There are lots of numbers on this page. Um, essentially, there's four slides that I have, and I've tried to break those down by fall sports just so that you can absorb those. Um, there also may be, we may, we may have missed a club um, that's not represented here. So this is, though, it does have lots of them there. And I will say that these numbers obviously do fluctuate throughout the course of the season. Um, but again, I worked with Mr. Reynolds and Mr. Peake on getting this put together. So the far two left columns really just show the total number of kids in each of those programs. The next set of columns break these down really by um, smaller teams in that group. So for instance, your volleyball program traditionally will field a freshman team, a JV team, and a varsity team. And that's what those numbers represent. So at Nelson County High, um, this, this past season, they had nine on their freshman team, 16 on their JV, and 17 on their varsity. Um, also, Mr. Peake and Mr. Reynolds were able to provide a few notes here. Um, volleyball is one, just an example, a program that does have quite a bit of participation. Traditionally, cuts are made in that space. Um, and you can see that at Nelson County High, they had about five middle school kids participating on that freshman team, and Thomas Nelson had three. So this is really how you read the information. Um, I'm sure you guys have had a chance to take a look at that. So I had a question on um, some of them, they don't have a capacity. Does that mean there's not a capacity like football or cross country each year, dance? I will say every program is a little bit different. I would say to really answer that question very thoroughly, you want to talk to that program lead. Um, and we have a few here in the crowd that we could make reference to if you wanted to reach out to them. Um, it looked like most of the discussion that I had, uh, the capacity notes really revolved around postseason roster setting. Um, and then also in some events, for instance, um, track, I believe, was one of them. You can only have so many, uh, there's only so much space out there and there, and, and it's very difficult to schedule 40 kids to have an event when there's only so much time in that day to make that happen. So each program is very different, um, but there are a few of those specifics. So to be clear, if so when we're looking at these totals, you have Nelson County total and Thomas Nelson, and so I think we're imagining that if combined, okay, right. it, you would subtract. So including in that comment, in that number on the left column would be those middle school students. Is that correct? That'd be the right here. This, this is kind of where you're referencing the middle yeah, school so students. Yeah, so the middle school students make up part of the Nelson County High School total and the Thomas Nelson total. Is that right? For some programs, yes. Okay. 
How many students do we have playing up from middle school to high school? Do you have a clue? I can't see very good on that. I've got my glasses. Yeah, that's what So really, boys' soccer seems to be the primary sport there, if you look at it. Yeah, so just as an example, right, each program has 37 and 39 kids for boys' soccer. There's the breakdown, JV and varsity. Looks like both of them have around nine middle school kids playing on JV. So hypothetically, um, if they didn't, Siri's talking to me. If these kids didn't, didn't participate on those high school teams, you would just subtract those numbers off of the totals. Mm -hmm. So, in theory, you'd have 60. Correct. Obviously, you're not going to have 60, but you, that would be the current. And then, I mean, interesting, a lot of our schools don't have true freshman teams just based on numbers. Is that accurate? I mean, we, we have middle schoolers playing on JV oftentimes. It, it really, you know, some of, the cha some of those kind of challenges are the same things faced throughout the course of the state. Um, depending on the program, even if you were able to field a freshman team, if not any other schools had a freshman team, then who are you going to compete against sure, sure. as an example? So traditionally, like soccer, um, which is my background, and I coached soccer at Thomas Nelson for a long time, um, there's not any freshman soccer teams competing at the high school level. There's just a JV and a varsity. Sure. But that is different in every program. And then I guess the other question would be, a lot of these programs are not offered in our middle schools. So there's also a fluctuation in those numbers when you're not feeding a high school program. They, these numbers may seem low um, band, for instance, you know, and even archery is gonna suffer a little bit because we have schools like Boston and New Haven that just struggles to get coaches and things like that for those programs. So the high school will have a lower number if you're not feeding it appropriately. Correct. Yeah, there's no question that feeder patterns in middle school impact high school participation. That's on all fronts, no matter which way you look at it. Mm -hmm. I was surprised how high the basketball numbers are, really, between, those, uh, between the schools there, it just does show uh, there are some middle school students participating in girls, especially uh, basketball, which has been a little more common. And then you've got a few at Thomas Nelson as well uh, for boys. But if you look at the Thomas Nelson, oddly, you know, their basketball participation is higher because they have middle schoolers playing up by seven. They got 10 to seven, you know, kids more in a school that's about 140 kids smaller, just as a reference point, which is a bit surprising. Any other comment, question? No, I appreciate, appreciate you putting this together for us so we can sort of have a better understanding. Um, I think there was a misconception that, that there were middle school kids that were making up the JV teams for the high schools. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean they're the entire team, it just means that maybe some of the eighth graders may play a little bit better than some of the other kids, and we're playing mm -hmm. those kids. Right. It doesn't necessarily mean that those kids have to be on the team. Right. From a coaching perspective, I mean, really from a, in a program perspective, it's really advantageous to have those kids there. It's a, another year you have to work with them, obviously, to grow inside that program, so that makes a lot of sense. Which I think is what we are seeing this year at Thomas Nelson. Um, they've really encouraged a lot of the kids to come over and um, sort of, I don't want to say train or practice with the high school students. So they're sort of building that foundation much sooner. But also, also like I said, some of these kids, we don't have wrestling at, Bar at Boston. I'm not sure we have wrestling at New Haven. So now these kids are going to be exposed to those programs at the high school level. So I don't want people to kind of look at this and think, oh, well, our kids are, you know, our middle school kids are making up the high school teams. That is not, in fact, the facts. Right. Not, in fact, the facts. <laughs> we like it. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Thank you. Our next uh, item is our athletic facility planning. That would be Superintendent Bradley. So in May of 2023, uh, the Nelson County Board took action to transfer just over $2 million from the construction fund to the general fund that was originally targeted 
as a part of BG1s for upgrades at Nelson County High School and Thomas Nelson High School. Uh, tonight, the board is evaluating potential upgrades to athletic facilities at both campuses that could utilize that funding. And this is a pretty basic overview of that of those plans. We don't, you know, have in-depth photos, et cetera. I think we can assume that these uh, costs um, would lead to significant facility upgrades on both campuses. I know there's a lot of conversation about, well, you know, what's the future of this campus, that campus, um, and our conversation really as a district has been about just continuing to invest in these major campuses, whatever form or fashion. This is just over $2 million. I believe it's approximately $2.1 million. It's about a million dollar investment at the Nelson County campus and about a million dollar, 1.1, I believe, at Thomas Nelson's campus. Uh, this includes full turf replacement at the Nelson County campus, and this level, this grade of turf and field would be quite a bit um, more substantive than maybe we invested in the past, even though that turf has been really uh, good to us and it's played out over the course of much longer than we anticipated. These turf uh, replacements are ante anticipated be between 12 and 15 years. Um, so really these are potentially 15, 12 to 15 year investments depending on uh, how you want to maintain those facilities. The, the better you maintain them, the, more, the longer uh, they are uh, stable and um, safe. So. Uh, this is a full turf replacement at Nelson County High School, a new track uh, at Nelson County High School, a new turf field at Thomas Nelson, and a new tennis court facility at Thomas Nelson, largely because the tennis court foundation uh, settled and it has to be recovered in order to participate on those. So again, just from a broad perspective, from a district conversation, um, these are originally targeted, uh, this money was originally targeted to support athletic upgrades. This allows us to do that in a different way um, and upgrade facilities. So, any questions? You know, the, the, here's the only question I would have. I mean, without a doubt, the tennis court repairs, it's my understanding that's not even a usable court right now until that gets fixed. So, so there's no question there. Um, we already we already have turf in Nelson County and, and track and I mean we have to maintain these things um, you know to, to keep our athletes safe and whatnot and, and Thomas Nelson I'm I'm not necessarily against it but I mean as everyone knows and it's probably why a lot of people are here we're, we're getting ready to talk about the future use of facilities you know so I think we have to be real transparent about that and so my my, my only hesitation would be you know if should the school transition to a middle school, I, I'm, you know, I'm curious the your opinion on the need for a turf if it is in fact that is if that's the use of the, of the facility. And can I, because I go. I'm going to share that concern with Miss Deaton, but not so much because we are investing at Thomas Nelson, but because we're not really sure what that high school that connected campus is going to look like, which you guys will hear more about later. We don't know where that connected campus is going to be. So to, to actually, because we haven't looked at the logistics of this connected campus, this has been 30 days of us even bringing it to the superintendent to actually dive deep in. To make a decision on this right now, I think would be a bit premature. Um, I don't know if there's a timeline that this has to happen before that bigger conversation sort of takes place. Because again, there's logistics behind that conversation that we haven't discussed. But what you're saying in theory would be that we wouldn't know which either campus would be. Right, that's what I'm saying, yes. Right. Well, my motion would be to, to go forward tonight on approving the Nelson County High School turf and track and the Thomas Nelson High School tennis court repair and to table the Thomas Nelson High School turf and to take it up next month or whatever, put it back on the agenda. Just, I would, I would request that the board move forward on those three projects that we are, are sure of. These are things that have to be done. We have to take care of facilities we already have in place. So that would be my motion. Because what's the Let's cost to go from turf to grass? 
So we did uh, some investigation. The cost to go from turf to grass really over the 10 year period is a wash. You're essentially spending about the same amount of money um, on that. So, Mr. Norman. I see, I see we can go and do both, t both fields because it's not a fair. That's still we, if, no matter where it turns out to be, I think doing both fields is a plus because it's going to equal out to the same money in 15, 15 years. I think it That's equals right. out somewhere along the line. Do you know exactly when that line meets? Will they equal out when turf and asphalt uh, turf and grass? I think in this case, uh, Thomas Ellison, it would really be in that second rotation where you would come completely clean because, you know, 13, 14 years ago, they planted grass there. Right. Um, but really, from a perspective of um, district leadership, we're just investing in all facilities. We want to continue to upgrade. We know that these facilities, regardless of whether they are high schools as they currently stand or become something different, will be heavily utilized. And these are really uh, things that multiple students in sports will play on over the course of the next decade and a half. I agree well, with you, Mr. So, Superintendent. So, uh, thank you. so you know, um, of the current board, in fact, even of the superintendent, I'm the only one that was around whenever we initially did the decision for the turf field at Nelson County High School. Um, I was. I'm sorry? I was. Uh, it may have been towards the end of it, but I know Mr. Wheatley uh, was one of them that really pushed for that uh, to ensure that the track was able to be used for track meets and it also came with the turf field. So uh, Mr. Wheatley was a, a, a driver of that. Um, whenever, and, and part of this is so that, um, for transparency, so that people can understand some of the, the conversations that you know we have to think about on this. So originally, whenever that turf field was decided upon at Nelson County High School. And I can remember that uh, Mr. Rapier, who was on the board, Mr. Hall, who was on the board, Mr. Wheatley, who was on the board, um, I think Mr. Payton was myself at that time. Um, Bill Broadus, uh, we all know Bill Broadus, a uh, great advocate for athletics here in the Nelson County Schools for decades. Um, uh, as well as just an advocate for the school system. Um, he brought forward from the football um, booster club this idea about doing turf at Nelson County High School. And at that time, there was, there was also a lot of discussion like what Mr. Norman was saying about, well, if we do it at one, shouldn't we also be doing it at Thomas Nelson High School? Because that was the time whenever Thomas Nelson High School was beginning that construction phase of things. And I can remember pretty clearly that it was Mr. Rapier who said, listen, you know, it's a quarter of a million dollars back at that time. I think it was about 2010. Quarter of a million dollars for uh, grass field at Nelson County High School. Uh, it was going to be approximately 600 and some odd thousand, maybe pushing 700,000 for a turf field at Nelson County High School. And, of course, Mr. Rapier had, you know, the perfect concept and idea there and he said listen the school board will make the investment of that quarter of a million roughly of what we would have been paying for grass fields and if the booster club can bring forward uh, a, a way to pay for the difference then hey we support because that's what we want to do we, we always like to partner with our uh, our clubs our athletic groups uh, and also at that time back in 2010 there was not the funding available to the Nelson County Schools to be able to spend, you know, almost three quarters of a million dollars on a, a turf field. Not that it didn't have value, but it, the money was just not there. And some of the rationales were, as we said, you know, you can save some money. Uh, annual maintenance on the fields. Mr. Broadus did a tremendous job of of giving some data on how that would play out. And then also another piece of it, which to me was even more critical when it comes to turf fields. So any of you that have played football, and I did not, I see some in here that did, Friday night, grass field, it gets torn up. And the whole next week, it's all about make that field ready for next Friday night. And that means um, soccer, Mr. Martin said he was a soccer coach. Soccer, you can't play on the field. Banned. You can't ban, you cannot practice on that grass field. We've got to get it ready for football. 
And one of the rationales for turf was it would allow that need to be eliminated and more and more student groups, athletic programs, clubs would be able to use that turf field. And we've seen that happen. I mean, I don't know that there's a weekend that even goes by during the good weather seasons that I don't see at Nelson County High School. The lights on, um, little league football, um, you name it, that is happening at that field. So that turf field has been a huge positive investment for Nelson County Schools. Um, now, one thing that I do remember that Mr. Hall, because he was always very good about reminding us to be wise with the funding. Mr. Hall said, now Booster Club, make sure that you all start squirreling away some money over the next 10 years. Kind of like what we as individual people would do with roofs. Make sure you squirrel away a little money every now and then because you're going to have to replace the roof on your house eventually. Times have changed though and I think what we're starting to see now is the district is in a good financial situation to be able to make that investment and actually be it as something that's positive for the booster club and like Mr. Norman is saying making sure that we do that for both athletic facilities because the district is in the position to do it. And, it, and it's just the right thing to do for both this, fields. Just to be clear, in the facility planning uh, funding, we are. Uh, yes, yes, right. uh -huh. yeah, right. that, that's, a, that's a good clarification there. Yeah. So, you know, I, I share that as some historical context of why that initial turf field was created. Lots of positives around it. and. You know, we've been able to actually leverage the use of it more and more and more by different groups. Uh, every night it typically is being used. And that's what we want out of our facilities, is those facilities to continue to have their athletic fields used on a regular basis. So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of along the same idea as Mr. Norman here that, one, it's a good investment, uh, especially now that this turf apparently is, has an even longer lifespan I mean, we were told in 2010, if you get 10 years out of it, you're doing good. Now we're starting to hear maybe 15 with this new style of turf is what the life expectancy can be. Uh, and in you know, doing it equitably across both of those campuses. Um, you know, we've got the funding. You know, you know I would I, also if say If that. I may, and this may be a procedural issue that Eric stops me on, but I don't think my motion got a second, and in light of no. the conversation, did it get a second? No, okay. it did not get a I second. Was, I was going to withdraw my motion. I, I do, I think you all made some good points about investing in both facilities, and certainly I, I, I want to withdraw that motion. Okay. Oh. Okay, do I hear a motion to include our Nelson County and Thomas Nelson turf uh, uh, reconstruction of the tennis court and what was that third one? I track. Mean, it's also the track at Nelson County High School. And the track at Nelson County High School. I need a motion. I'll make a motion. Thank you, Mr. Norman. I need a second. 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 Thank you, Mr. Jackie. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carried. So Thank I, you. I, I would also hope that we also continue to focus back to this is great investment in athletics. We've also got to continue this conversation on making sure we're investing in the instructional opportunities for our students too. Yes. Okay, our next uh, item is a Connected Campus Vision Master Plan BG1 update, Superintendent Bradley. So uh, Paul Tenius is, uh, and uh, Stephen Ward will join us just oh, to remind Stephen. us okay. about the Master Plan at Nelson County High School um, and how that's impacting the way we think about potential costs on that campus and uh, with an updated BG1 that allows uh, architects to, to begin designing on that campus. All right, thank you everyone. And um, this is really just a continuation of the conversation we were having last month um, as far as the master planning is concerned. So I left you all with uh, three concepts and really just here to hear your feedback. You know, the intent of the master planning process, again, is that 30-year vision we're looking long term. We're trying to make sure we're not putting, uh, you know, parking lots where we want ball fields and buildings where we want parking lots and so on and so forth. We're really trying to be strategic with the land we have and uh, where we're going with things. So um, with that, I left you with um, these three concepts, the quad and athletics loop, the central quad and the expansion of the back 40. And I'm just curious, 
you know, as you've had a chance to look at these and think about these in the, in the context of the, of the campus, uh, you know, with the up center pro projects going on, everything else going on in the space, if you had preferences, if there were things that you were concerned with, um, really just here for your feedback this evening. Um, and we're going to take this, basically, we're going to use the master plan. It's just going to help us as we go forward. And Stephen's going to speak a little bit more specifically to the high school and the BG1. But as we think about phasing, as we think about what to do when, it doesn't necessarily say, because we said we want to do a ball field here in 10 years because we change our mind or there's a different need that we're locked into that. It's just we know that's where we think we want it now. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so, so with that, did you have specific feedback on those concepts that I left you with um, last time or any, any thoughts or I can go through individual ones and get your thoughts? Are there any concerns with the backfield with water or streams or anything like that? I mean, have you guys looked at the... For, for going to the other side of the property? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the biggest concern, honestly, on that is getting across the... There's kind of a creek and a half back there that we'd have to cross and quite a bit of topography. So there would be a decent amount of cost associated with getting back there. And with that, you know, when you put fields out that far, we're talking restrooms, we're talking mm -hmm. water, electric. So it, it does become a pretty expensive proposition. And when you talk about that, just to be clear, where on the map you're describing beyond those fields that are... Right. So it would actually connect next to, um, in this case, it's at the up center expansion, but the OKH basically expanding, okay. and then it would extend follow the existing road, which kind of loops into the lot right there, and then extend out beyond. That seems to be the best place topographically to connect. Um, and then it's, what's nice is then it can connect out to the highway that direction too. So it's a good way to have an, you know, a relief valve if there is a big event there. Uh, but it does create a, a lot of nice opportunity for a you know, baseball, softball specific facility back there, which could be really, really fantastic. So, it's definitely a possibility. And it's something that honestly could be done later too. It doesn't have to, it doesn't necessarily involve moves in the center part of the campus in a short term. So any other questions or I can flip back through these if that's helpful. Um, I just, uh, my concern mm -hmm. is not a real big one, but enough. Uh, I don't want to lock in the up center to we'll, where we cannot add on to it or to right. make it bigger. Okay. Uh, well, that is adding on to it, but you know what I mean. Yeah. I, I don't want to lock it in where we can't work, that be a workable thing. Okay. That's, that's great feedback. And I think, you know, that's one of the benefits of moving in the future, moving baseball out of the front of the campus is there's a, a, a lot more space there to expand the up center. And honestly, it could, it could expand towards the center of the campus too, depending on how things evolve with the high school footprint, that sort of thing, so. Yeah. I think I go back to something, I don't, you might have said it too last time, is the parking spaces. Mm -hmm. If this is one connected campus with additional drivers, will we have, a di will we have enough space for that many students? I think that's something that's going to have to be weighed um, as we look at that. The, currently, the, the, the high school driver lot is oversized for how much it's used. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's surplus capacity there that could be utilized. Um, and, and really rethinking some of these lots so that they can have either additional capacity or a little bit more flexibility to support, for example, like some of the after school, um, some of the parking that happens now in the front part of the campus after school to support baseball and softball. If you can distribute that a little bit better, it'll help in the long term too. So it's really looking at, it'll be looking at kind of parking counts with each, each project, if that makes sense, uh, each building project or each athletics project. Well, I think the main thing in the parking for students, they won't be all together. I mean, they're not gonna be at school at the same time. So who knows how many parking places we really need. Well, and my only concern about parking would really be just big events. I mean, yes. you know, yeah. it, last, weekend i mean you know you're walking all around the school to get there and, and that's okay if there's you know spaces available they don't all have to be together but yeah and i think i think looking for opportunities for flexibility i mean even and i i don't necessarily would, would wouldn't necessarily advocate for this all the time but 
if there are practice fields that can support overflow parking, for example. I've done reinforced turf fields, so you kind of work in this grid material into the soil and then it can support a car but then be playable as a surface. Uh, we've done that on rugby fields and soccer fields. So there are ways to kind of work around that and allow for some overflow parking, um, but where you're not just paving the whole thing sure. too. So you get some dual purpose for those two or three times a year when you have a huge event, you know. Okay. Other comments or feedback on these? Okay. Um, well, I'll hand it off to Steven to talk a little bit about phasing. Thanks. Um, so we started to look about at how we could uh, phase projects um, based on the way uh, Paul's team had put things together. Um, we were able to think about this for the two schemes that kept everything on the primary campus. The one that moved the fields up to the north, we didn't look at phasing in quite the same way there. We, that would take some more study. But with the other two, we could at least look at uh, how we could anticipate it going. Um, and I'll say that based on some discussions we've had with, um, with Mr. Bradley, Phases one and two could probably be interchangeable. It's just that those would be two separate phases. So um, the first phase, as we've described it here, would involve um, the west side of the high school, whether the current footprint stayed or it got removed and replaced. The west side of the high school would be uh, part of the first phase of the work. That would also then include this new parking lot for the up center and for the high school, and it would include relocating the softball field. Uh, also as part of that would be some uh, detention for stormwater drainage and reworking some of the road areas around that yellow area. And uh, if the allied health proceeds north of the, at the north side of the up center so that we don't need all of the, um, all of the service lot at the north section there, What's identified here as 1A could be part of that same phase. So that's, that's one phase of the work. Um, a second phase of the work would be the east side of the high school, um, and that would include the reworking of the roads, the bus lanes, uh, some uh, pedestrian ways uh, around the school, and the reworking uh, somewhat of the student parking lot. Um, and that would take that second phase. And then, Athletics, the bulk of the athletics we identified as uh, a phase three. Um, so everything in the red here, um, based on the vote you just took, the field here could be renovated in uh, this coming year, but then reworking uh, track and field facilities and other facilities around there would be identified as future work, um, as would the relocation of baseball. So that's that looks at uh, ways of phasing the project so that each of those could be, um, you know, you could, you could take them as a whole, as in you could take one and two at the same time, or two and three at the same time, or you could divide them up in that way as, uh, as projects that were uh, achievable in a couple of years, for instance. So the phasing is important because we have students in the building, and those students would have to transition to different spaces if you if you approached it from a different uh, in a different way. So just to just to be aware of that context, you'll have to you know block off major components of the building in order to achieve um, one particular phase. So based on that comment, even if you were to pursue what's identified here as phase one and phase two as the same project they would still be sequenced separately. Yeah, and you still, while it wouldn't disrupt the entire 1969 wing, it would disrupt some of it, including in this particular, it would disrupt some of the media center and some of, I guess, what is called a hall currently. So those would be some things that would be lost in that process. So, so the reason we wanted to talk through the, the phasing and next steps is really, the BG1 that we have uh, tonight is really a cost estimate that allows the board to understand. Tracy, you back here. You want to say something before we? No, go ahead. So the BG1 is really it's just a form that allows 
uh, the district to move ahead under design under, under a design process that allows this campus uh, design to move ahead with the architects. Uh, this was um, this is an update to the BG1 and the update updated cost estimates for construction on this particular project for phase one and two was it 75 76 something like that 76 so. million the bg1 approved tonight would be a 85 million dollar bg1 and that is for phase one and phase two of this canvas model um, to be clear in terms of the timing of this uh, obviously we don't have you know the 85 million today in our bonding capacity but in order to build towards this project, that would be essentially a pretty stable starting point for the budget. Um, you could reduce, you could add over time, depending on where you were financially as a district. Um, and it's important to know that, you know, you're not committing to spending $85 million uh, tonight. You're just committing to a process that would allow the architects and teams to begin the design process more aggressively to put in front of the board over the course of the next 12 months. So I do have a question. So we're talking about three phases that would be over an estimated time of what? Do we know? Due to the students being on the campus, it does take a little longer. Um, and Stephen's not going to give you a timeline. <laughs> He's not going to do that because that's his, that's his job. Uh, he's not going to tell you. So I think it's safe to say that an aggressive timeline on a phase for construction right now is about 18 months, so a year and a half. So if you were to say both phases, to do those aggressively, it would take you three years. The design process, and Stephen also won't uh, commit to this, is generally 8 to 12 months kind of as a minimum standard to do this well. Um, so that's a, just kind of a minimum. So we're looking at an eight to 12 month design process. Uh, this team's already very familiar with the campus. They're already very familiar with understanding the um, kind of the need in the building. They've already evaluated that building and gone through multiple layers of that. So it does accelerate the process. Um, but that's, so in, in theory, phase one and phase two could be completed in approximately four years. So. It's very difficult to have this conversation before the next conversation comes. Um, because when I think about 85 million, let's, we know it's probably gonna be a little bit more than that because you know, it's just how it goes. So let's say it's 95 million, let's add just 10. And we're doing that over a three year period. We have other locations that this next conversation could revolve around that would not only save us time, but it would save us half that cost. Um, so I think, again, this is, this is sort of the, the hard part about having these types of conversations in front of a community when part of the local planning committee would have worked this out and um, we wouldn't be trying to make these decisions and look at this and go back and forth. And I think that's, that's the part that I'm really sitting here thinking, okay, let's say we move to a connected campus. It'll take us three years to get there, and it's going to cost us uh, $80, 95000000 million. Wes, to be clear, when we had on the LPC, the, the renovation in Nelson County was part of that. Right. Is this altogether different than what was? So most recently in October of 2022, the local planning committee reconvened and had an additional finding to the DFP that included a new high school wing in Nelson County. At that time, the cost went from estimated approximately from 20 to 25 million to 40 to 45 million for the new high school wing. That's essentially what that new wing right there is generally going to cost. It's all about square footage, and that new wing is potentially that original price that we anticipated. We never got to phase two. Currently, renovations on buildings are also quite costly, um, and we had cost estimators because of the size of that building, uh, the square footage in it. That's the current cost estimate for that. If you're going to build or renovate it 
in a way that allows it to be upgraded for the next 30 to 50 years, that was the, the, the estimate. And to be clear, is, is it possible, Wes, you could move on phase one, which is what was discussed with the LPC, and choose not to for funding reasons that's right. move on stage two or three? Is that, is that a possibility? That's, uh, that's, yeah, you could do anything you wanted to do in theory. And I think there is, uh, you know, just some financial realities you have to sort through along the way. And um, that's, that's what I'm saying. It's be. really hard to have this conversation and knowing that the next that that really the logistics have not been worked out, and we we haven't had an opportunity to talk about the financial um, cost associated with the connected campus and where that campus should be located. Um, but yes, this was part of the original DFP phase one and two. I believe, but yeah, the, the master plan sort of came in later. Yeah, um, we did the master plan largely because Stephen shared that oh, yeah. we needed to we needed to really step back and look bigger on the mm -hmm. campus. No, I agree. Well, and I think I mean some of what you're getting at, Miss Bowling, is the order of the dominoes district wide. Mm -hmm. um, and while these were parts of that. District approved district facility plan. Um, does this have any sort of negative, positive? No, we don't know. Impact on the additional, and again, I loosely use the term dominoes to mean that whenever you're doing any sort of large scale construction, renovation within a school district, you need to do certain things first to allow the second things to occur. Uh, it's kind of like with the work that we've already. Uh, approved the design on for New Haven as a uh, P5. Uh, part of that building is going to be renovated while the students are in the untouched part, and then it would flip-flop. It's that domino effect. Um, right. And so as I listen to you, I think that's some of what your concern is there, is that how does this have an impact on those additional pieces mm -hmm. of that LPC and the, and the district facility plan that they um, hashed out over those those meetings and the students like and, and the students, students yes. around mm -hmm. inside this space what's that look like and, and that's why i think you know looking at the phases looking at the stages is really a next step for any conversations around this campus there are multiple phases you'd have to go through the first is begin to identify what those stages are made up of mm -hmm. so really the, before us tonight in order for the architects to begin to, to, to do the work to a degree, um, it's October, you know, in order for them to do the work uh, in any uh, subsequent months on this particular campus, um, we, would, we would be committing to potentially a design estimate that puts the, the, the BG1 around $85 million. That's where we're at tonight. You're not committing to spend $85 million. That's right. You're only yeah. committing to the design process. Okay. So you're committing to a design process that allows the architects and the team constraints to make decisions that then they can share with you uh, monthly. Which, which does have a cost to it. Right. So we do pay the architects a fee based on cost. Their starter cost would be based on that fee. So really, the, the presentation around we can talk about connected campus um, as a conversation piece here, or you guys can talk about the BG1, really up to you. Yeah, I'll, and go ahead. I'll, I'll just, I'll, uh, and I even have a hard problems with the cheaters reading it on the screen here, so I'm sure folks in the audience have a hard, hard time reading some of the documentation that's shared. Um, so, Mr. Ward, please do not take this negative in any way because you are a tremendous partner of this school district over, over a decade. I mean, you all have done some terrific work and you have found ways to make magic happen uh, for our facilities on behalf of the students that use them. Um, but whenever we talk about fees, I mean, I know that's something that as a board member, I continue, I've continued to hear. It is a set percentage, okay? 
So it could be upwards of $4.1 million of architecture fees. And like the experience we went through last year, um, it was quite a few dollars um, that then came to a halt. So this is one of those where I, I and why I share that is, Ms. Bowling, your, your comment about uh, it's, it's important to have a, a plan and a vision and a strategy before just jumping into something. Um, because at that point then, we've made commitments. Um, and I may not be saying that the exact way you would, but I'm, I'm trying to listen to different uh, conversations that are happening, and that's a little bit of what I'm hearing you say. I, I guess, yes. If, if, if we're going to move in the direction, and I don't want to take anyone's glory away here, if we're going to move into a direction where it's a connected campus, we haven't looked at the logistics of what that looks like. The, the, the board decided to shift and remove the vision that the superintendent and the local planning committee had worked on and shift to the board's vision in January of this year. It shifted. Um, we can acknowledge that. What we, are, where we are right now is if, if that is the, the new vision for the superintendent to design and work up 30 days ago, we gave him and he came back with the Connected Campus, which we've not heard yet. Um, but how can we make a decision on this and not really know what the plan, the logistics are? Again, if we're gonna, if we're gonna talk about student success and student experience and academics for students and really look at what's best for students, and we believe as a board that a single Connected Campus is what's best for students, why would we spend 85 million or 95 million when we can spend 40 at, at another school to build onto that school and we could be it in at 18 months versus two to three years? That's what I'm saying. Does that make sense? To me, it, it, it doesn't make sense because I think when we look at Nelson County campus as it exists right now, I mean, we have the up center, which is serving our high school. I mean, we have, I, I just think the vast number of facilities that are on that campus, it is just more established. I mean, Thomas Nelson is, is a great campus and it is more modern in certain ways, but like, I, I don't think there's a substitute for the fact that with the, the, the biggest draw on that campus is the sub center. I mean, it's, it's a, a $40 million reason. That's my, that's my point. Is it worth $40 million to have our high school next to the up center? Is it really $40 million worth that? I, I don't think there was ever, even if we were not here tonight talking about a combined campus, which we are, never was there ever that I've heard a desire to, to close Nelson County High School campus. So this building was gonna have to be remodeled anyway. It was gonna have to happen. It's outdated, it needs repairs. So even if we were not having a discussion tonight about a combined campus, I think everybody here knows that it is desperately in need and it's outdated and it needs it needs repair it needs to be updated and that is expensive so i don't see where that gets us out of this anyway i mean money has to be spent at nelson county absolutely it does and i am not denying that at all um that building to put middle school students in that building would absolutely need to be repaired and it would have to be brought up to date but it would it be 85 million dollars would we that again that goes back to is it about money is it about student success i just don't feel like we've had the opportunities again this is why we don't have these conversations <laughs> these conversations need to happen with groups of people i want to be able to have those conversations with groups of people um, again and this is just me thinking out loud i think it's it is an expense for us to to move in that direction if we know there are other viable options that will make us better stewards of tax dollars. Just thought. And have a bigger instructional impact for students. Uh, again, that's Let's don't forget that one. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we did, we did originally plan to renovate and remodel the Nelson County campus. You know, 
And that's still the, the original estimate from KDE was $25 million for the high school renovation. Mm -hmm. That was the total high school renovation. There was no new construction at that time. As we went through the process, we realized new construction on part of it was going to be smarter. So it went to around 40 to $45 million for that part. But we were still estimating, we were at that time, we were estimating 15 to 20 million for the renovation. Currently, renovation costs are edging up closer and closer to new construction costs. It's supply and demand issues. The 40 million, 40 million is basically how that works out, phase one, phase two. If you do it at the level of quality that we feel like it needs to be for any major campus. I share that just as some large historical context and how we got here. Obviously, as you think about, if, it's, if it is about you know, rethinking the nature of uh, where schools exist and how they exist, that is a bigger conversation that would you know, take many people involved in that. The, the one thing I could offer just as a clarification to what Mr. Jackie brought up is that the, the fees that are listed on the BG1 are upwards of $4 million for, and that's for uh, the whole design team, all of the engineering, all of everything through the end of construction. So that's the yes. full four right, year right, right. period. Yeah. That, that, um, that's why I said upwards of 4.1. Yeah. So yeah. We, we stop at any point you tell us to stop. Right. Um, the, it's incremental. The amount that you would yeah. commit to now is really just as far as you want us to go studying this mm -hmm. until you tell us don't take That's it further. Right. So. so to the extent we don't get to phase three, I think three was the high. If, if we don't get up into the upper level facility planning for maybe maybe athletics, maybe we decide we're just out of money and we need to focus on something else. What, and phase three is actually not part of this BG-1. Okay. Uh, phase one and two are part okay. of the BG-1 that we're talking about right okay. now. Thank you. Yeah, and the plans, the, the athletic is on our own. And that's really that athletic yeah, it's not center included in the, that would be yeah. left out. Everything else is doable within the... Yes. Within the but I want to say area. that the diamond here for this, for this is the up center. That's the diamond to me. It's, it makes it very easy for the, our students to walk across, get what they need at the vocational school, come back. $50 million. Yes, ma'am. Uh, to me, money does not, when it comes to kids, we think it's like you do for your own at home. You'll do without so somebody, so as your children can do for. And, and I don't see an option of avoiding spending the money at Nelson County. I mean, I don't see anybody volunteering to come in and renovate our campus for free. I mean, we're going to have to spend money on that We're going to have to spend money. I, again, it's not denying that that campus needs but if you look at that campus, would it need $85 million if it was a middle school campus versus a high school campus? We know the design is different. We know that the costs are going to be different. I think, again, it goes back to if we're going to have the conversation about a connected campus, let's have the real conversation, the one that looks at the financials, the ones that look at the actual benefit of, again, if it's about students and it's about academic success and changing the way that, that we're working in Nelson County, then let's look at all of it. Let's not just assume it's gonna be on one side of the, the county versus the other side of the county. Um, I think there are, there's a lot more logistics that need to be worked out in this conversation. And I agree, you know, the BG1, we can stop at any time. We can, we can have a moment to where we can pull back and say, you know what, we've rethought it and this is what we, we really don't want to head that direction. I just want people to understand, the audience to understand that these commitments are big commitments. They're not just, you know, $5,000 to have an architect draw up drawings. This is a plan in motion. And I understand that and I, and I respect your concerns. I, am, I think we're kind of repeating ourselves. But I'm going to make the motion to approve the updated BG1 updated cost estimate based on the master planning concept. Okay, I have a motion on the floor to uh, pass the BG1 according to uh, present drawing, correct? Do I hear a second? I'm sorry. Okay, do I hear a second? I'll second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Uh, All opposed? Nay. Nay. Three to two, it carried. Thank you. So 
The next step was to talk about the campus vision. Mm -hmm. Okay, our next uh, item Thanks. is the Up Center program update. Um, I, those that are here that are leaving, I would ask, I mean, if you all would, yeah, and you stay. have the time, I'd ask that you be patient and you stay, because there are just a couple more things that I think would be key pieces yeah, yeah. for the conversation. We skipped the, we skipped the campus Excuse me? overview. We just skipped the campus overview. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the connected campus is Oh, I'm sorry. Connect this campus vision, Matt. Okay. So th this, uh, this, this presentation tonight is, I'm going to try to do it as quickly as I can, um, recognizing it's, I believe it's 9, 9 p.m. Yes. Um, and the, um, the audience is obviously thinking through a lot of different conversations. I think it's important to know that this is a very much a beginning conversation. There's nothing in this conversation tonight that is, that we're going to hand you a piece of paper halfway through that kind of gives you an overview of it more in depth. Uh, but there's nothing on there that's set in stone. It's a seed idea to talk about. That's it. Ms. Milburn's still here. Good to see you because I remember two years ago and a half years ago, I sat and I gave a very similar presentation. And uh, you were here that night. And we had quite the conversation in this gym. For those of you that were here two and a half years ago, uh, some of these same things we're talking about tonight were also talked about then. So there's really the purpose of this, of this presentation is to just provide a very broad introduction discussion for our board team. They asked for it last month, and this is what this is. It also allows us to really compare, in a way, the relationship between the original goals of what was the 612 community campus versus what we're calling a connected campus. And lastly, we want to just clarify certain goals of the campus. There's three big ideas that also resonate. We've learned a lot in three years of facility planning. We've been forced to think through a lot of things that really um, we largely hadn't thought through to the level of detail that we have now. Lastly, I'll go to the third one. It takes everyone working together to make any of this happen. And it takes long periods of time to bring these programs to life. This is how many meetings we've had in the last three years about facilities. These meetings led, to us, led us to talk about things like equity and access, where people live, the impact of how distance in, distance influences student attendance, CTE programs for students in middle schools, staffing efficiencies, and how we can continue to give more and more money to teachers and students in our district. These are all things we've talked about over and over again. Here's some big themes that we've learned about as we think about where we are and where we're going. Student significance, their sense of purpose is the most important form of equity that they feel like I belong here, that I'm doing something that's special. We also know that UP continues to expand and the idea of the UP Center continues to expand. Thirdly, teacher-powered programs and communities of schools are the future of schools. You think about the work going on in some of the aerospace collab and other collabs around our communities, the future looks like teachers leading programs together. And lastly, there's no question you know, we talk about this, the board has talked about this. If you go into our parking lots today, there's not as many seniors there because their learning is everywhere. And that is a reality of school. At the end of the day, everything I talk about tonight is nothing more than an idea on a paper. This is what it takes to create any aliveness in this process, and it takes time. You have to have parents, teachers, students, board members, community partners as a part of that process that are allowing ideas to come to life to make these things stronger. This was the question we started with two and a half years ago. That was 54 years ago, and those students were changing the following year. That was the question we started with. We talked about all the change over the past 100 years, all the change over the last 50 years in our schools. And we came to, to say, ultimately, we wanted to be able to unite people, place, and purpose 
through increased opportunities for students, through connecting community resources, through continued optimizing resources. And we came up with a plan at that time, it was called the Community Campus. It was a seven year experience. There would be 1,200-ish students at Thomas Nelson on the west side and 1,300 in Nelson County on the east side. That plan's been discussed, many of you are aware of it. Tonight we're talking about a connected campus. And I wanna be clear on the alignment of a connected campus. We're assuming today, I think in this conversation, that a connected campus, or the original conversation, was that the high school home base would be connected on the Nelson County campus. And that east and west middle school hubs would exist, what they're called, how they play out over time. We're not certain exactly today, we just know that that would be it. You could call them home bases, hubs, schools, whatever. I think the truth is there's going to be interconnectivity in any of this if it does occur. We said at that time, two and a half years ago, the goal was increased family engagement. The goal was increased student engagement. Those things don't change in this model in terms of our goals. Our goal was to invest in world-class facilities. Our goal was to strengthen our relationship between students and community partners. Finally, we said we wanted to increase academic course offerings, increase early college and career access, and increase student leadership access. Those were all part of the original vision, and those still stand in this vision. We're, I'm going to pass out a pamphlet that is really just a summary of the ideas. This pamphlet is just called Connected Campus. It gives us something to talk about. It gives the board a reference point for thinking about the design of that. Mr. Smith and Ms. Beasley will pa we'll pass this out, and I'll explain really the purpose of this pamphlet in the front cover and the back cover as a starting point. So again, if you take a look at the front cover, for those of you that have this, it's really about connecting people to people across our community. Irregardless of where the school is, this is a place that will connect people. On the back page, it breaks down the really the goals of the campus model. And it explains how we would be working to connect people, place, and purpose through success networks, places and hubs, centers and connect ups. On the inside, I'm gonna break this down further. It looks crazy on this slide, we'll break it down. So firstly, at the center of this conversation are networks. This looks very much like what this young lady who graduated last year experiences now across our school. They have the academic core. They get to personalize that. They have professions-based learning. They personalize that. Early college and dual credit experiences. All of these things would be key priorities. Student leadership and athletics. Career pathways. And finally, whether we call it Cardinal Crew, Care and Connect, all those different versions, houses, those are all goals in this model. Because students need personalized networks of success. Students need to be seen, known, and heard, and accepted into different groups to be successful. Students need those opportunities to connect with professionals and pathways. Those two networks, skill up networks and community networks, do expand and network students in different ways on a connected campus. Secondly, you think about the, this was the original mock-up of the, of the campus two, almost a year ago. If you think about places on the campus that, are, that really build identity. This was a mock-up of the campus a year ago, it's changed now, but really these hubs that exist on the paper, those are places with identity and significance on the campus. Whether it's an early college hub, the, the academic hubs that exist, student leadership, arts, and career hubs. Those are places that are really led by teachers and programs across that campus. In the same way, this place, this is an example, of an early college hub, hypothetically, would be a place where students really come together to connect with that experience. Those are examples of hubs of learning that allow us, in the design process, to build that into the model. Key to that is student and family choice. There is no question 
that as we invest resources, there continues to be opportunities for students and families to choose. In the same way, this campus will be very fluid and really serves as a connector and bridge to a wide range of people and places across the community. Finally, if we think about these centers, this is currently the Area Technology Center. And the power of purpose comes to life when students are a part of unique, specialized programs. They choose to seek significance and purpose. Last year, if you went to any of the Level Up events, you saw students with a sense of identity and purpose. That is the future, really, of success for students in our schools. These are just some of the programs and students that uh, gained certifications from last year. Those, these are, don't, don't get too caught up in the name of these. Some of these are just prototypes. So we have the Up Center that exists. It's got multiple programs in it. We're talking about the Build Up Center at Bloomfield. We're talking about expanded health sciences allied health, which we don't have a name for it, but we know that we're currently partnering closely with Flage Hospital. We know that Air Force Junior ROTC needs a place and it's a special part of that campus and should be. The Bluegrass Aerospace Center is an important part of our ecosystem. It's not on the campus, but it's an important center that students are a part of. The Thrive Center, the Next Center, our virtual school. It exists only virtually. And then we have these next programs. The reality is we can't predict what things come to life and what don't. These are ideas that really organize around the idea that students would have choices, as they do today. They would have choices to be a part of these unique centers that are centered around significance. Athletics obviously are a big part of Connected Campus. Couldn't go into all the details of what that looks like. Know that it's a big part of the process. And it is an important part of purpose and significance for students. And finally, this is the last piece, is we've continued to talk about how do we bridge middle school students with access to programming. That was, a, that was where this all started two and a half years ago. Middle school equity and access middle school programs. Our reality is we have an opportunity on the, in these centers, in this campus, to have what we're calling here connect ups. Whether it's health science and medical, aerospace and flight, engineering and robotics, the arts and media and agriculture technology. These are all opportunities for students in middle schools to be a part of connect up programs across the campus. Here's where we are. Really, this is a very introductory conversation. I have principals in our high schools right now. We've talked to the staff to let them know we're having a conversation very broadly. The next step would really be working with school leadership to determine what stages could look like over a period of time and how we share those stages. That's generally where we are in thinking about the conversation that we're having. So again, nothing happens without multiple people at the table. Nothing happens without people being a part of creating things that, not, that don't yet exist. So that's, a, that's an introduction to Connected Campus. I only ask of you, really, as you look at this, that you're thinking about it and that you know this is the conversation we're going to be referencing as a part of, potentially, a connected high school campus. OK, thank you. Our next item is the Up Center program update, and that's Ms. Arnold and Stephen Ward. We can go back to this next month. I would, if we can go back, I don't know if, if there's, if your next item was to talk about, you were moving on to the next agenda item, is that right, Diane? The Up well, the next item is, uh, we've already discussed the BZ1, the Master Plan and Connected Campus Vision. Here's, you know, I hear the, the comments tonight, if I, if I could just briefly, I, I hear the comments tonight and I hear from different people with different desires in terms of whether you were for community campus or against or whatever, and I hear overwhelmingly the, the need for some direction, and I mean, that, that's absolutely, that's, that's warranted. I mean, you know, we've been sitting here, uh, this is, I guess we got sworn in in January and here's October and, you know, we've just been kicking the can down the road and having a hard time getting any kind of direction. And, and I really, I value this vision. I, I, think that, I think that Wes has done a, a great job and I applaud him for, for putting something together that uh, we voiced at the last board was something that we wanted him to look at creating a vision around. Um, 
This is the direction that, that, I mean, just to be totally candid, that I envision for the future of our district. It really is. I think there's a lot to be gained from having all of our resources on one campus and our most precious resource being teachers and the ability to just be able to, to have, to be able to offer these students a tremendous amount of classes and resources within that campus. And with that in mind, I would like just to, just to be authentic with the board and to be candid, this requires a lot of fleshing out and, and you know, Wes and his team would have to do a lot of work, but, but I would like to make a motion that we move forward with this plan and we direct district leadership to further develop a plan for this connected campus. So that's my motion. Okay, I, hear, I have a motion to move forward with the connected campus. Do I hear a second? I second. Okay. Uh, okay, all in favor? Uh, uh, all opposed? Nay. Uh, I, would, I, would, I would again ask those that are disappointed in leaving to please stay. If you have the time, please stay. Yeah, so I'll, I'll ask for a roll call vote of who voted which way. And, and I want to be clear, my motion was... I'll, I'll ask for a roll call vote of who voted me. which way. Excuse I, me. I, I, want, I right. want to clarify that the motion was to direct district leadership mm -hmm. to develop a plan for the community campus. That, that was, that the, was motion. the motion. That was the motion. It's the further development of uh, develop right. a plan. All right. Okay. But okay. Uh, please please Norman, stay. Mr. Norman, your vote? Yes. Uh, Ms. Deaton? Aye. Nay. Uh, Ms. Okay, I didn't say your name, Ms. Bowen. It's okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. Jackie? Nay. And me, yes. Okay, three, two. Now, because they're going to develop, more develop in the plan. It, hold on, hold on, please. Okay, we're going to move on. Okay, our next one is... Uh, uh, up center program update. So this is also a request by the board to include into conversation around CT expansion for the build up program in Bloomfield. Yes, so a couple of months ago, actually, we had uh, some conversation with board members. I think, Ms. Deaton, you were one of the four board members, ladies, and you really please, talked I'm about sorry, the idea. I'm sorry. No, Wait, please excuse say, me. Ladies, if excuse you have me. The time. You go ahead. You've got the floor, Ms. Arnold. Go ahead, please. So, Ms. Deaton, you made reference to we need to think about a win for Bloomfield, and what could we do to create an opportunity for Bloomfield? So, as we think about Bloomfield CTE expansion. It's really not only a win for Bloomfield, but we see this as a win for our region as we think about the future of career and technical education. So at the last board meeting, we introduced this idea. We shared with you a timeline. So we have had two meetings with Build Up Committee. And uh, our last meeting was at the Boston Training Center where we could see what some heavy equipment diesel mechanic opportunities could look like. We've also been in conversation with partnering districts. So our next plan is we'll be having a meeting next week, October 26, to continue this conversation where we will be getting into focus groups. The committees will be in focus groups to explore what it looks like to think about facility design, program design, um, also funding and finances to help bring this work to a reality. And just keeping in mind, we would be one of the few high school programs in the whole state of Kentucky and really thinking about how we regionalize this opportunity to bring regional districts and employers together to increase opportunities for students in our area. So next meeting is October 26. So the one, one question I have. Uh, let's say this is just hypothetical. We have excess amount of land over here, okay? Now, are we limited to land in where you want to put it? Why would we put it over there when we've got all this land right here, the 99 acres that we bought? Tell me that. Why, why have you chosen what was chosen would probably be helpful for all of us to understand. 
So I think it was thinking about future opportunities within the Bloomfield area, knowing where Bloomfield is located, how we could partner with other districts nearby where they would have an easy way in, easy way out to have access to this program. And also it would just be a great location and uh, even thinking about how could you utilize a gym to create an indoor dirt area where kids could continue to train even if weather was bad outside, you would still have an opportunity to keep learning active. So really, and I think it goes back to some of the conversation with Ms. Deaton. Like I said, she said, let's think about what opportunities could be in Bloomfield. And this is how some of this came to life as we thought about what we could do to really increase traffic and opportunity in this area and bring people to the table in that work. Okay, because I've had people ask me that and I thought, well, I might as well ask you and be done. Yeah, and if you recall at the last board meeting, what was going to be that heavy equipment area diesel, we did say let's explore what that would look like for health science because we knew in our current design, some of our programs didn't have a home. So it just allowed a way to help address some of that and think about how can we leverage other facilities in the district. Okay, that's, that's why I said I didn't want to be limited on what we could build at the Up Center because I know there's been talk of culinary. I know there's been talk of other things that I know the culinary part is expensive because you have to set up like a commercial kitchen, I assume. I don't, I'm not sure. But um, I just didn't want to limit space. Uh, you know, because we do have all that land over there, and I thought, well, you know, you got all that land to play around, and you don't have as much at Bloomfield, so that's why I ask a question. Anybody else? Okay. So, Mr. Ward was just simply going to update us on the timeline for the Up Center. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, as we talked about last month, the area that um, we're reworking in the up center is this area at the north side of the building, uh, the side that was uh, originally intended for the diesel program and the heavy equipment program. Uh, and last month we were directed to go ahead and study how uh, allied health could work into that area. So we've met with the staff of Allied Health and the administration of the Up Center. Um, we were asked to look at Flaget. We had already looked at uh, the Meade County Allied Health uh, several months ago. Um, so we are looking at this area. Uh, on the previous slide, again, it showed you sort of where that was in the building. Uh, this is the area we're talking about. We've now had three meetings with the Allied Health staff. Uh, first, we met with them just to figure out what their needs were going to be, how they would want to program things. Um, the second meeting, we showed them, uh, I think, four different schemes that we had even narrowed down from, from more than that. Uh, just yesterday, there was a meeting where they selected this as the direction they'd like us to pursue. Uh, so at this point, we can uh, pull the engineers in and start looking at electrical, plumbing, mechanical needs. Um, and we're looking at uh, about four weeks for redevelopment of this part of the documents in order to have the up center uh, ready for going out to bid. So the next slide should be the schedule that we've put together. So this sort of goes through everything I described. We've completed those three meetings. Um, we're looking at about a month from now to have the 100% review set ready to go to CODEL uh, for them to put together their front end. Uh, documents, which would be the contract and bidding rules that are associated with the project, and then it looks like we could release for bid in mid-December. Mm, looks good. Thank you. Thank you. So we're looking Anybody at about two any months. questions? Comments, questions? No? Okay. Okay, thank you. Our next item is New Haven Gym Study and Timeline. This is our final item tonight. We have the... Uh, Mr. Pickett. Mr. Pickett was asked to uh, consider the potential for a new gym at New Haven replacing the old gym. And um, this is just a summary. Can I drive? Yeah. Thanks. Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah, so uh, the last board meeting, um, the uh, connector for the gym was approved to move forward. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Just, just you got a little closer. Little. There you go. Closer. Are. All right. Uh, at the last board meeting, uh, it was approved for us to move forward with the connector uh, between the elementary school and the gym. But um, as a follow up to that, uh, I was asked to go and uh, study a gym, um, study the existing gym and uh, see what improvements we could make for the gym. Uh, we also looked at uh, some diagrams uh, for a new gym on the site. So since the last board meeting, I've met with uh, Mr. Norman and Principal uh, Clark and uh, Sarah Rogers on site and reviewed some, um, some of the diagrams that we've been studying. So these first few slides are just uh, reviewing the connector that we looked at at the last meeting. So I can go through these quickly, it's more of a refresher than anything. Um, again, a new lobby and a new uh, connecting uh, corridor and uh, flexible uh, meeting spaces as part of that. <clears throat> uh, this connector, as discussed, would create a new image for the existing gym. Uh, off of the two courtyards. This is uh, just renderings of that space uh, as part of that connector. <clears throat> so we went away and studied the existing gym. Um, as you might know, uh, the gym has bleachers on the ends, which has been voiced as a, uh, a negative for the gym. Uh, people would rather be sitting uh, similar to this gym on one side. Um, so what we looked at was the dimensions and the square footages of the existing building and the gym itself. So the overall building is around 9,500 square feet. Uh, we looked at that in comparison to the, the KDE elementary school size gym, which is limited to uh, 5,500 square feet. So the, the building itself is a right around 4,000 square feet bigger than what the KDE would allow. Uh, there are some tweaks that can be made to those numbers, but it's, that's right about the limits that you can get uh, a KDE elementary school sized gym. So again, it's about 4,000 square feet less than the existing gym. <clears throat> so another way to put that, if you tore the existing, if you demolished the existing building and built a new gym, it would be about 4,000 square feet uh, less in size. So what we studied was the, uh, for this, these, these slides here, what's the difference between the existing court uh, striped dimensions versus uh, a K through five uh, court. Uh, the existing court is sized for a high school gym, uh, which is really not a great, um, size for a K through five um, facility. So this is just a diagram showing the differences. Uh, obviously on the, the left is the existing facility, the existing building, and the proposed or not proposed, but a potential new building would be much smaller. Um, so this series of slides just talks about some of the possible renovations or the comparisons of sizes. Uh, again, the overall Court size is too large for K through five. Uh, there are concessions and locker rooms in this building that you can't get. Uh, you could not incorporate in a elementary school size uh, gymnasium. The existing seating is about 150 split on the ends of the gym. This is showing a reduced court size down to an uh, uh, elementary school size gym be the same size court as what we're in here today, uh, which would be uh, not, it would not be limiting to tournaments for the K through five. And what that allows us to do is add seating on the backside. So we would get a, about a, another 140 people could sit on the, um, the court side. After meeting on site, we talked about, uh, we should consider replacing all the seats so that there would be a, uh, some consistency and a true upgrade to the court. And then we talked about 
um, the goals would have to move to make this uh, possible. So those would be uh, not just moved, but replaced uh, with uh, modern lifting mechanisms and uh, safety mechanisms, which was voiced as a major concern. And then, of course, uh, the connector would also influence or uh, impact the corner with the concession area, so that would all be part of the connector. So we're really looking at, this is the options to a renovation. We would basically double the seating, um, reduce the court size to more appropriate K through five, uh, new ball goals, and um, a few other miscellaneous upgrades there. So then we also went a step further and said, because we knew this is on the table or it's in people's minds, what would it look like or would it make sense to consider a new gym? So this is just the plan showing the connector between the elementary school and the existing gym. Um, the first option that everyone leans to is to tear the existing building, the existing gym down and build a new one uh, adjacent to the school. Um, the major problem with that is there are existing classrooms along the edge where this new gym would touch, and um, we would basically lose the function of all the classrooms on that side of the building, uh, and KDA, KDE would not allow um, classrooms without windows. Plus, um, it pushes the circulation around the building further, uh, which would really take away from the current plan which uh, with the two courtyards. So if... Uh, pushing the gym away from the building to maintain those courtyards and maintain the natural lighting into those classrooms, uh, that that's the fallback. Here's what you're looking at is demolishing the existing building and building a smaller gym in its place per the KDE guidelines. And if that was too far away, you could tweak it, but you're still, you're tearing down an existing building and putting a new one back in a very similar location. And it's, uh, it would be 4,000 square feet roughly smaller. Um, so this is just an overall plan showing the existing school. So really what we're talking about, um, utilizing the existing building with bleacher upgrades, um, reducing the size of the court, uh, adjusting the goals or adding new goals. It's about $150,000 upgrade plus the, uh, the $1 million connector as opposed to a new building, which would be about $5 million for a smaller building for the new school plus the connector. So about, let's say, $1.2 million versus $6 million for the smaller building. So this just summarizes that. Uh, the existing building is roughly twice the size of KDE elementary school size gym, uh, which includes the locker rooms and uh, the concession area and some storage areas that you can't get in the KDE um, square footage. And then um, we, can, uh, we can basically double the seating capacity by reducing the court size. Um, so that's, that's our study. That's where we've taken it. Um, I guess what, we would, what we're asking today is to prove moving forward with the renovation of the gym so that we can continue with the development of um, the elementary school renovation. So we're simply proving that in theory they would resize the gym and upgrade and we would spend some money upgrading the facility um, largely because it's a uh, the size of the building is twice the size that we'd currently be able to create if we built a new one. Uh, the only thing I was looking uh, researching or looking after was if you build a new one they're going to lose storage and you're going to lose they won't put you can't put dressing rooms in a new one either because the state doesn't allow it because it's not a middle school any longer the floor doesn't have to be as big because it's not middle school so i'm just making everybody aware that is a big thing if you're losing that kind of space um at a school in a gym and i have talked over with you know, different people, and you know, we got to make be careful what we do, how we approach this one, because I just hate losing space. 
It's before, like somebody well, taking a closet away from you at home or something. Before we move it to the KB elementary school size, though, I would not want to eliminate the middle school from being able to use it currently, so. Yeah, it's a long way off. Okay, gotcha. For yeah. them to adjust the gym. Yes, it's disheartening to see the, the not getting a new gym and bringing it up to the building, but I know Mr. Pickett showed me some beautiful pictures of it and, and that extension connector is really beautiful. And, you know, we're going to make the best of what we got. And I, and I appreciate all your hard work on this. Thank you for meeting up with me and everything, talking to me, explaining to me in a way that I can understand it and, and reassure me that it's going to look beautiful when we get done with it. Thank you. So we do have to make, we do have to approve uh, in order for the architect team to to do this because it is an adjustment, mm -hmm. and it was something they were asked to study. So we just want to act on that. I make a motion. Make Looks great. Okay, uh, we have a motion before us to approve uh, moving forward with the resizing the gym. Second. Second. Yeah. Well, I wasn't finished. Resizing the gym court side, the KDE recommendation, elementary school size, and doubling the bleacher capacity. Okay, uh, uh, Ms. Bowling made the motion. Mr. Jackie second, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you so much. It's gonna look really good, really good. So our next meeting is Tuesday, November 14th at the Boston School, followed by d Tuesday, December 12th at the New Haven School. Meeting dates for 2024 will be shared in November for the board and then potentially set on the December 12th date. I would make a suggestion that we maybe add a, a meeting in there, maybe, or a forum or something so we can start, you know, partnering with our community, talking to our teachers. You know, what is it we're going to look like as we move forward in this other direction? Is that something we could do or should do in this time frame between now and the end of the year? I think the next step will be meeting with high school principals to talk to what stages could look like and getting their feedback on what that is. Okay. Okay. Uh, board celebrations. I'll just remind folks that Mr. Fletcher uh, is at Thursday, October 19th, 7 p.m. at Thomas Nelson High School, the Arts Center. Miss Day and and Miss Day, yeah, we've got some, I, I'm getting the date and time right, we've got some uh, Haunted Chorus 3, or I forget the exact name of it, but. Uh, there we go, yeah. And Haunted Concert yeah. Part 3. And Silent Auction and Bake Sale also going on at the same time, so a little fundraising going on as well. Okay, and we have the girls uh, saw, uh, the girls volleyball playing in uh, tournament right now, so we wish them all the best. Anybody else? One more thing. I experienced for the very first time a uh, cross-country meet at Thomas Nelson, the Hillbilly Run. Um, if you get a chance, if that gets, you know, to be hosted next year at Thomas Nelson again, I highly encourage anyone to stop and if you can find a parking place, stop and experience it. Um, there were people parked out on 245. It was a unique experience to see just all the tents from all the schools from around the state. Um, again, it was a, a really cool thing that I had not it is. seen before. Yeah. Um, but again, great okay. things going on. All over the county, yes. Okay, I need a motion to adjourn. Motion. Okay, Mr. Norman, thank you. Second? I'll second. Uh, Ms. Bowling, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? I have it. Okay, now that the meeting's over, I do have a statement to read, and I would ask that anybody that has any comments or anything just hold on to it for a moment. So, for the 15 plus years that I have served on this school board, I have always focused on decisions, making decision making on what is best for students versus what is easiest for adults. It was a piece of advice I was given by a well-respected colleague when I was first appointed to this seat and I've held it closely with every decision made since. While those two will often align making conversations and decisions to occur easily, 
There are times they do not. A little over two years ago, this district started the work of addressing what would be best for middle school students through a long and appropriate process of forums, meetings, discussions, and extraordinary work by a cross-section of stakeholders who were members of the local planning committee. While their recommendations were not always well received by 100% of the community, it has increasingly become obvious that it was not because the work was not focused on what would be best for students. It was because it was different and to a small group of adults, not easy for them and often hard to even understand. Over the course of those two years, as parents and community members listened, asked questions, and honestly engaged in discussions, I started to receive emails that often started, while I didn't agree with the community campus in the beginning, I now realize. Even my loving and supportive wife did not think the recommendation of the district facility plan was the right answer at first. But last fall, I started overhearing her tell people that she now understood why it was best for all students. Ms. Berry, who is now our board chair, voted in the affirmative during every single vote related to creating the needed learning spaces for all Nelson County students during the course of 2022. Affirmative votes that she earlier this year loudly stated were, because my mama told me to get along with people. Just another example of doing what is easiest for adults. Throughout this calendar year, the current sitting board, with the exception of Ms. Bowling and myself, have taken approaches at every turn to stifle guest comments, led by Ms. Berry's personal decision to limit guest comment time, to shield herself, and certain other board members from having to listen to community stakeholders. This approach has never occurred at previous Nelson County board meetings over the past 15 years, and history shows that this approach is never taken except when someone wants to hide something. History has never looked back on such actions with a positive view. This board has shown a lack of professional leadership that I have continued to beg for that has fallen on deaf ears. Since January, there have been repeated requests for team building sessions, even by the board attorney, that have fallen on the deaf ears of certain board members. A great example is the recent response from Ms. Berry during a board meeting to my request for her to show leadership with this board, which was, I already know what you think, implying that leadership is as simple as knowing someone's opinion. Numerous false statements or outright lies have been used to sway opinions of other board members and the public. <clears throat> the most recent being, <clears throat> Excuse me, folks, folks. Folks. The most, <clears throat> excuse me, the most recent being giving out a fake email address that was told to be my alias account or stating that district leadership is preventing opposing views from joining the conversation around the Bloomfield heavy equipment CTE discussion. You can sit down. You can sit down. This is not your turn. Sit down. Sit down. Or stating that district leadership is preventing opposing views from joining the conversations around the Bloomfield Heavy Equipment CTE discussion when the one stating such was invited to participate. Made up information 
continues to be shared to further a hidden agenda. Statements such as, we don't have the money to support the approved district facilities plan, followed by attempts to prevent or discredit the information from the financial agency who is the expert. Tonight, this board has on the agenda plans to discuss, and you heard it, a proposal for a facelift of Nelson County High School that potentially exceeds $80 million. Yet lies have been told that the district could not afford a $24 million middle school on the Thomas Nelson High School campus. A middle school that was part of the approved DFP to address the primary issue discussed the last two plus years about middle school equity. Not a contrived issue surround merging of your high schools. And while the list is long and exhaustive of unethical and potentially illegal actions by certain members of this board, when I learned of the emails a board member sent to others that shared personnel information related to an investigation, I was dumbfounded by another board member that thought this was okay, the sharing of personnel information. When a board member took it upon herself to engage an outside attorney to try and buy out Superintendent Bradley's contract, I was confused as to how someone could not understand that individually, none of us as board members have the authority to do so. When I learned of the close relationship between certain board members and people who sued the board, actions such as accepting campaign contributions from plaintiffs, one board member who raised a plaintiff as her own daughter, and another who requested to be withdrawn as a plaintiff simply to become eligible to run for a school board seat, I became very concerned that this board would become bought. But when I began to hear firsthand reports of a board member who has repeatedly berated employees in the central office, including Superintendent Bradley, I became sickened. For a board member to threaten an employee's employment simply for doing their job, which may not align with how that board member wants to micromanage day-to-day -day operations is downright criminal. And this is the simplest thing that a first-year board member is taught. It is illegal for us to become involved in hiring and definitely firing decisions. While I am not a perfect person as none of us are, I do hold myself to a high standard of ethics and expectations when it comes to the work I do on what I consider one of the most sacred jobs one can be involved in, public education. Because of this strong belief, because of the examples I give above, which just scratch the surface. I hereby tender my resignation from the school board seat effective at 11.59 p.m. local time tonight, Tuesday, October 17, 2023. I do this with a heavy heart, not because of any failure to win at all costs as we see unfolding by certain board members' actions, but because I will not be able to support what is best for students in the official capacity of a school board member in the Nelson County Schools. I will, however, continue to advocate for what is best for all students first, foremost and always. So if any members of NC Ford or the plaintiffs in the latest lawsuit filed by the Honorable Matthew Hyde have any questions, you know where to find me. I apologize to the many parents, students, and community members who have emailed me since this past weekend if I have not yet responded to you. It was not because 
I was ignoring your voice, insight, and opinions like the majority of the members of this board continue to do. It was simply because I wanted to give the respect each of your emails deserved with a thoughtful reply, and I simply ran out of time. Respectfully submitted October 17, 2023, Damon M. Jackie.